Welcome, welcome, Vibranters. It is Wednesday night, and we have a very pleasant evening in store for everybody. So, first of all, let me just say hey to Mari in the chat, and we got James from Family Fungi. Hello, James and Elise. Oh, man, Logan, thank you so much for the super chat already. Super chatting. Glenn J, Cody, Davin, love you guys. Thank you so much for Ooh. jumping in. <laughs> Tell your friends that we are about oh. to have a great conversation. And man, oh, man, I say it all the time, at least to myself. I should probably exclaim it publicly more, too, that I am the most blessed and lucky, fortunate podcast host in the world to have such awesome friends and regulars gracing our screen. So we have Mar uh, Mario from Symbolic Studies, always reliable Mario, Michelle from Michelle's Healing Home, here to bring us more herbal knowledge, and Kyle from Tippecanoe Herbs. I've got my inner herbs blend synchronicity <laughs> herbal medicine from Kyle here, ready to go. Looks like he just took some too. And of course, the great slick dissident Gabriel, my friend. So Welcome, everybody. How's everyone doing? Who wants to say hi first? How about Kyle? Yo, yo, what's up? How's it going, y'all? Oh, man, it's so great to be here, Chance. I also agree that um, you're you have such a great um, podcast, you know, crew. You're always there's always so many like it's Michelle and Mario that introduced me to your podcast. And it wasn't that long ago. It was earlier this year. And it's like coming full circle now. Not only that, but, um, you know, the magic of like, you know, we met in person, we did a cool herb walk together um, with my wife and my baby. And so it's not just about like the, you know, uh, the abstract world of the internet, you know, here, here you have a way of like bringing people back together in the real world and also, uh, the pursuits of knowledge in the real world. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, man. And this is my Wednesday show. This is my Wednesday show. It's like, you know, I, I stay up late and listen to this. And so I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, how, how are you doing, Michelle? Thanks for all those kind words, by the way, Kyle, you're the man. I'm doing great. And I second what Kyle said. And it's amazing to see this stuff come full circle because uh, I'm, I've like visited Kyle and his wife at their shop and I'm from Milwaukee. So we have that connection. And I never would have thought that when I met them like a couple years ago, three years ago in their shop, that I would be doing a show <laughs> like this and that we would have this weave together and it's beautiful. And I'm just so excited. I'm really pumped to be talking today about what well, Scorpio, the herbs and healing and everything it's going to be amazing so uh, hi, hello to everyone out there in the chat too really excited to be sharing knowledge and mario i asked you to join us because the uh, subject i mean i always want mario on deck but the subject uh that we're going to be discussing is the doctrine of signatures in relation to scorpio and we have master herbalist kyle and michelle here to join us for that conversation but you know, why not also bring in the symbolic experts? <laughs> you know, we've always got Gabriel for that, but Mario, of course, brings all kinds of excellent observations to the table. So, and we have a slideshow and the, <laughs> the only thing that I need to do is figure out how to make this slideshow not autoplay. So you guys talk amongst yourselves for a moment while I do this little tech support moment. <laughs> no problem. Uh, thanks for having me, dude. This is great. Uh, I have not talked about Scorpio symbolism that much during this season because i'm working on a different project which i'm really excited about but uh needless to say you know there's kind of a consensus out there with some symbologists and astrologers that scorpio may very well be the deepest sign in astrology and you know i think there's a lot of good reasons um to make that case and so there's just so many different things to talk about with it it's a very interesting and uh deep sign so um i have a bunch of notes here and we'll get into it. And I'm really stoked to see what Kyle has to say about the uh, doctrine of signatures aspect of everything. And I helped Michelle put together her slide. So I know what's up with that. It's always great to have Slick here. So yeah, all is well, man. Sweet. Yeah, I agree, Mario. I think it is one of the deepest of signs. I, you know, personally, I feel like I was initiated 
uh, into astrological correspondences with biblical mythos through Scorpio. And I think it's it might be like if anybody wanted to try to compel somebody else to think along the lines of, you know, the biblical stories are just allegory for heavenly dynamics. Scorpio is a good place to start. Uh, you know, Judas Iscariot in his death, uh, you know, he he was overcome with remorse about selling out the Christ and he wanted to return the 30 silver coins that were covered in blood. Well, the silver coins, that's the 30 degrees. That's the degree sign of the 30 degrees of the zodiac. If you're com coming from a, a tropical perspective and he wants to go back to the money changers and give it back to them. And so uh, I found the actual uh, astrological image of Scorpio is literally putting his claws on the scales of Libra. And it's going in reverse direction. You know, it's going backwards against the grain of time to put his hands on the scales. And his scorpion stinger is pointing in the other direction. And so, yeah, so much of the story of Judas Iscariot is very clearly laid out in the heavenly dynamics so. oh yeah 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 absolutely i love that dude that's awesome yeah the uh, scales of libra right are known as the uh, sometimes as the northern and southern claws so right. that makes perfect sense i know the artwork you're talking about <laughs> right and that's the sea laws it's the mm. sea laws of justice and we nice are, yeah and we are definitely under the, the law sea of the sea. laws the law of sure. the sea hmm for yeah, sure awesome, dude. Well, I figured, figured out, out the uh, slideshow. Nice, nice. <laughs> That's not the first time I've been, uh, you know, had to figure out how to not make PDFs autoplay. But hey, maybe this time is the time I'll remember forever. <laughs> Kyle, by the way, Kyle, it's nice to meet you. Yeah, Gabriel, it's great to meet you too. I yeah. was I jumped on once when Michelle was was on and um, just briefly, briefly met. But yeah, I'm a big fan of your of your work, and um, it's going to be great to. I mean, already my mind is kind of blown about the 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 coins. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I love it. Yeah. I think I've been, um, I've been normally when I'm in the zodiac sign, I get really into it because of Mario's work because he does so much posting on the zodiac sign, and I knew because he hasn't been doing so much with Scorpio that he's got some bigger plans going on. Um, but that is a great um, place to get into the vibe of the season usually is going to his YouTube channel. And I recently just did last uh, earlier. Yeah. Friday this week, I did a aromatics um, astro aromatics incense class where we talked a lot about this, uh, you know, the, the Scorpio sense, if you will. And so I'm feeling really deep in the season myself. I was also thinking about like the um, maybe not biblical theology, but the astro theology a lot of Scorpio. And um, one of the things that kind of crossed my mind was because Scorpio is a water sign. It's the, I always think about like cancer being the bubbling brook, the primal waters and Pisces being like this expansive ocean and Scorpio being fixed water. The image that comes to my mind is the Aztecs and the Mayans and the way that they would used to look down at held pools of water to look above at the heavens so there's this there's this commonality between looking down into the underworld to see what's above and the stories above and then also being ruled by mars traditionally and there it is there's mars the little mars in water what does mars in water look like it could look like the star inside of a pond inside of a black pond inside of like this stuck um, uh, deepness, you know, I think that's really cool. It makes me what you're describing, think of like the planisphere experience where there's an entire ocean of stars, but you know, what's in your cup at any one moment. Oh, cool. That's the current night sky. That's cool. And that creates that tableau or picture of a story for that time of year. And, uh, the tableau is what I think is the most interesting area of research for me currently of like, what is the story when we can see this quadrant of the sky at this certain time of year and how is uh, what's visible in any one moment going to inform 
the miracle stories and mythology and even history. And you know, like I've come up with a, a newer, like a, a further developed idea about this concept of Lumashi star writing, constellation writing. I even kind of think I might want to move away from the word astrotheology because it's so charged and syncretism has a really bad representative out there currently threatening that people will die. And <laughs> so like, you know, these words, these words get all charged up. So I really like the constellation writing or stellar tableau. Those are good phrases might be candidates for replacement. But what I'm realizing now is that like I, I was really puzzling on why would the ancients be, I don't know, foolish. It seems foolish from our modern perspective enough to look into the constellations and decide that they could pull history, the history of the world out of what was going on in that storybook above. And now I, and it clicked all of a sudden I was like, well, in their own time, they had Kings and rulers and emperors, you know, dictating that like, put me up there, <laughs> put me up there in the stars. So maybe they're just sort of working from the assumption that whatever is up there got put up there by someone like themselves for a reason, cause it really happened. And that's why they can pull history and stories out of it and believe in them as true or spread them as, you know, uh, literal. Anyway, that's my current thinking on the uh, the stellar tableaus. Nice. I like that idea of uh, that the term is kind of carried, picked up some baggage and it's time to get a fresh term to to bring it to a new level. And even gives people a reason to look up. Like when they hear Lumashi, they're like, I never heard of that. Do, 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 you know? And then, them, then they won't even find it. I don't think it's Googleable. Maybe we'll start it. We'll start the trend now. <laughs> Uh, one other thought I've been having is that isn't it fascinating that the scorpion is election season, the the season of the kiss of betrayal, you know, uh, and then like you were saying, it's got that Mars aspect. And now we got Brazilians of people rioting because they feel betrayed down in Brazil. Oh, and the whole like crypto FTX crash thing from uh, right. Jufro Bank. Friedman, like, his <laughs> name and his his bank in his name. It's so hilarious. It's, it's such a trigger. It's, it's such so, an intentional seriously, trigger. Seriously, like that that's happening at the same time as all the other like you know Chappelle going on SNL and talking about uh, anti semitism and like it's it's right? super interesting. It's all Judas Iscariot. It's so it's so heavy handed. <laughs> it's so, it's heavy, so handed. heavy handed. I think that they're the power is wearing thin that they have they're bringing out the hammer and they're done with the you know with the chisel. Yeah, Gabe, to your point, uh, the election season thing is interesting because I have written down here in my notes that uh, there is a correspondence with the American Eagle and Scorpio. And so, you know, there's three different aspects of Scorpio esoterically. There's the scorpion, the serpent and the eagle slash phoenix. And Manly P. Hall and others have made the case that the American Eagle is a scorpionic reference. And even I, when you look I'm at Scorpio you. in the night sky, it kind of looks like a bird. And so I know um, down in South America, there's people who, um, instead of using a scorpion, they actually use a hummingbird, which I think is really interesting. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, oh, a hummingbird it, as well. Say, I'm sorry? Hum hummingbird is also the god of war. Ooh. Oh, yeah, for ooh. South American tribes. Nice. Uh, there you Aztecs go, and Mayans had a hummingbird god. So, uh, hummingbird in uh, Spanish, in Portuguese, is uh, bijou flor, and it's the it's the flower kisser, and so it also has a kiss, and this and this blows my mind because of ophiu kiss, and uh, kiss is initiation. Also, it's how you get things started. One thing that's also interesting about the um, the empire using the the eagle scorpion is that. I'm finding like the more the more I look into Roman history, the more I see astrotheology or constellation writing, <laughs> uh, zodiac encoding, and it doesn't seem like it's real history at all. And one of the places where that came up was the uh, the alleged last king of Rome before Rome moved into a more like democratic style, and then later fell to be an empire. Uh, the last king of Rome has this whole uh, Helen of Troy type story where he's like, you know, getting in. Anyway, I'll just 
fast forward a little bit. The last king of Rome, he uh, was killed by Brutus. <laughs> Not, I'm not talking about Julius Caesar, who was killed by Brutus. It's the same, they're repeating the name and everything. And so Brutus, who sounds like Buddha's, if you just drop the R, he is uh, the nephew of this last king of Rome. And he has a grievance against him because this king has un unjustly put the words of put to death the uh, many of the chief men of Rome. So to me, I'm thinking that sounds just like the sun putting to death the summer constellations when it gets to wintertime. And he's the seventh king of Rome as well. So there are seven months of warmer weather, seven Asiatic churches, seven heavens, a lot of encoding of this seven out of 12 uh, being seven good guys and five bad guys type of thing. And the five winter months or colder months begin with Scorpio. So at the point that the seventh king of Rome uh, is killed uh, uh, is by Brutus, <laughs> another Brutus, is also the point where the eagle rises or the, the Rome that we knew of later comes into being. So I find that interesting that, you know, we have this is maybe a uh, symbolism that's been repeated with empires over and over again. Yeah, exactly. That is fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. I love that. I'm learning a lot already. <laughs> yeah, where do we want to go? Should we jump into some of the uh, stuff that Kyle and Michelle prepared? I mean, they are our guests of the hour, and I know we can get carried away weaving on random things that we're currently thinking about and emptying our cups, but <laughs> we can we can let you guys take it away, and we'll just sit back. Yeah, sounds great. We're just, you know, we're setting the loom. You know, it's going to be weaving all night, so it's cool. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, we got to read uh, Cody's comment first. FTX and Samuel is 17. 17 is the seventh prime. FTX exchange is 117. <laughs> Two days after the 11 7 lunar eclipse. A lot of sevens and ones here. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Holy cow, dude. I'm going to screenshot that because I'm going to, I got to process that slowly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, a lot of clues that's there. Libra plus one or the Scorpio, right? Wow, nice. Oh my gosh. <laughs> cool. So I have to ask FTX, is that uh, crypto or I'm not familiar with what that is? Yeah, it was like a big crypto money laundering scam thing that a bunch of people put money into and then lost it all. Okay. To keep it simple. I mean, I couldn't tell you the exact narrative that is being told by the mainstream media. It's just, you know, more uh, pranks and jokes from our glorious um money changers <laughs> gotcha i'm not surprised <laughs> yeah ftw was taken so they went with the next letter over so. <laughs> <laughs> nice. all right <laughs> who wants yep. to start talking herbs of scorpio yeah. season oh yeah let's go all right um go take it away michelle all right well you know if we wanted to start with the slideshow we can um because that i know we start off with mugwort um over here so we can both riff on this one for sure um but kyle um if you wanted to start with mugwort i can as well but it's up to you uh, if you had like certain things you really wanted to get out um on it um Shoot from the hip, man. <laughs> sure. Okay, cool. I know that I know that you guys did like a whole episode on mugwort. So I'll just kind of fill in a little a little bit and then hand it back. And it's um, okay if there's review in this. I mean, we want to sing the praises of the beautiful mugwort. And if we repeat some of its beautiful qualities, that's all good. We're we're learning here. Okay, cool. Um, so here we here we have mugwort. This is the flower on the right. And the stem of the plant with the leaf. As you can see, there's a couple of colors that stand out to me, and that's the burgundy. And that is red plus black, or the, um, the colors of the sacral chakra mixed with a little bit of darkness to them, right? So um, Scorpio, if you know or not, is the, if we're in medical astrology, we have all of our alignment all the way down to the, from the top of the head, all the way down to the feet. And Scorpio rules the genitals and the anus and the lower part of the colon. 
it's uh, it's famous for um, elimination, moving things out. Um, that which does not serve us anymore, right? That's what's uh, that's what another way of of describing death too. You know, giving up. Um, there's even like in that word elimination, um, not just about like moving away waste, which is definitely a scorpionic thing, but the but even like not consuming like eliminating um food from your diet fasting a period of the time of year where you can um really tap into the deep spiritual um lessons that might be present through what it is that we can give up and, and that's something that may have been necessitated in a culture where we didn't have all this convenience and right now it's like People don't even skip a beat. They're going through the drive through spring, summer, fall, and winter. Or not even just drive through You know, you go to the big rectangle with all the food in it. You just got me thinking, like, I'm definitely due for a fast. Yeah, and fasting is available to everyone. Michelle's been uh, in, on your on your Telegram channel. Uh, I want Michelle to talk a little bit more about fasting because she's been taught. She's been the one that was brought that to my attention, really, in the, in the way that it has to do with Scorpio. But... Um, but also, didn't we just give up an hour of daylight too? That is another thing that we eliminated. <laughs> Good call. Wow, great call. <laughs> and uh, and so yeah, mugwort to me. I thought we gained. It. Me, I thought yeah. we got an hour back. Fall back, get it back. Is that right? Um, yeah, and they, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, oh, but they're getting back. rid of the whole concept of daylight saving time now. So it's yeah, it's on the back, the back side. You're behind. That's right. <laughs> It's hard to think of. But is uh, fasting and herbs a good combination, like to get into deeper communion with the virtues of herbal medicines? Certainly. And mugwort is a great one in that department. Um, and I'll expand on that a little bit more here in, on, on wormwood as well. But the idea is that we're, <clears throat> is that we're not only eliminating food, but we're also starving the parasites. And when you do that, you can use plants that are that have great uh, virtues of eliminating parasites from our body, not just physical parasites. Um, and mugwort is one of them, and wormwood is another. But not just physical parasites, but that which preys on us emotionally and spiritually as well. You know, um, and so I see the signature like Artemisia. We we're, here. We have like the lunar qualities of this plant. And this is a, this is definitely a big uh, lunar plant. And then we also have um, some uh, um, attributes of Venus, but this plant is really appropriate in Scorpio season for um, some of the areas of the body associated with the Scorpio. Um, Michelle, you want to, you want to jump in here? Sure. So I really love what you said with the parasites. Cause I was thinking that I'm like, yes, yes, yes. That's awesome. Um, and mugwort to me, uh, because we're going with the, uh, you know, the reproductive organs specifically for women, this is an amemagog. So what that means is it's an herb that brings heat to the pelvic region of the body. And so it can also bring on delayed menstruation, it can help reduce cramping because it will increase the blood flow. So sometimes it might seem weird, but sometimes when your flow is slower, at least I've noticed this and other women have talked about this, um, your cramps could even be more intense. So the amemagog action can actually help to reduce the cramping with the warming of the region, but also the increased blood flow. So that was one of the things that I definitely wanted to emphasize with mugwort, because even personally, you know, one of the things I do is I'll keep mugwort tincture next to the bed pretty much all the time, but especially when I'm on my cycle, because if I'll wake up in the middle of the night and you have cramps, you can take quite a bit of mugwort almost until your cramps subside. Um, and it does, it just works wonders. It, it really has eliminated my need for even needing to take any like ibuprofen, which I really don't do. Um, I don't need to take any other pain relievers if I'm doing stuff like that. So mugwort is just like a really good friend to the ladies and to the men, but specifically. Michelle, Mario, do you guys have a sonic slider tuning fork? No, we don't. You no. guys 
get one of those too, just in terms of like a pain killing. Nice. Okay. You can really help yourself out, especially if it's more of an injury based, but it's good for everything. So another thing to have right by the bed might help with cramps. Yeah, that makes total They're sense. About 80 bucks total, like, you know, 80 bucks one time purchase forever painkiller <laughs> tool <laughs> with no side effects. Nice. No, that's awesome. And um just uh to go on to the fasting part, um yeah, I mean, I just started learning about uh long-term fasting just this year actually, you know, and I'll say when you brought up the spiritual connection and trying to like get to know a plant or basically get to know anything yourself a little bit better, <laughs> fasting is a really good way to do it because what I noticed was as each hour went by in a 72 hour fast, I slowed down like each hour and I tapped into myself and my body and my thoughts, our land, the plants, the garden so much more clearly while I was doing that. And that was one of my favorite parts, one of my favorite things that I noticed. And um, drinking herbal tea during the fast was really uh, healing as well. So, yeah. I recommend it to anyone and it's, it's challenging, but that was the other thing too, is like you get through something like that and you just, you, you realize a lot of stuff. You realize that you don't need as much food as we're told. And also you're just given this boost of confidence that like, holy crap, I just did that. I just did not eat for 72 hours. And just to know that you have the self-control to do it, you know, all those things, it just, it's, it's a wonderful experience. And I've heard so many great stories about people healing so many ailments that they haven't been able to heal for years. And my biggest notice was um, hormonal balance. And I think that that kind of goes along with Scorpio, you know, but um, that was my biggest takeaway. Uh, just little things that I was noticing that I had no idea that it was actually attached to hormones after the fast. I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is totally back in balance. So it's a beautiful thing. I highly recommend it. Cody's comment here makes so much sense. He's saying fasting helps your energy become centripetal. So your energy collapses in on itself. Inertia cavitation. And uh, learning more about electricity as we have lately, thanks to Lucas and Topher and others, cavitation, having that gap for the pressure differential to, of uh, energy to fluidly move across, that makes so much sense. And, you know, you have a rock of food in your stomach, there's no gap for the cavitation action to take place in that core root area. And it's funny because, you know, we treat food like, it is our energy source, but makes you wonder, is it our energy source or is it uh, doing something else? Is it more of like the structural material for your body, but energy wise, it's more of a electricity thing and the cavitation thing. Like, I think we could be eating way less food. I'm talking for myself. I ate four sliders tonight for dinner and <laughs> 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 family dinner and i'm like whoa there's a lot there so yeah i'm really gonna think about that because i have fasted in the past and you don't really you might slow down and that gives you more contemplation in a good way but it doesn't necessarily like wreck your energy or anything and a lot of at a certain point you might even feel more energetic oddly enough yeah totally and i just i mean your body is allowing itself to heal when you're not digesting because digestion, it takes up a lot of energy. And so <laughs> I did. Yes. I didn't do the whole thing. I did half, but I was like, I got to just do this. <laughs> um, and part of the legend, sorry, just a segue of the mountain we live near is that um, it was used for spirit quests. And so the whole thing was that young tribesmen would fast and then they would take the journey up to the mountain. And they were, they were told to stay on the mountain until they met their spirit guide. And so I plan to work up to that point where I'm like, okay, I have enough energy. I can get all the way up to this mountain. You know, I just thought it was cool. So symbolically, I really wanted to do that. Um, but yes, the uh, energy it takes to digest your food is, um, you realize what's going on there too. And that your body is taking up so much time to digest that it's not being able to fully heal sometimes, you know, and that's, the, that's where the fasting comes in when on the healing level. Man, that um, is, go ahead. We're, we're unpacking so much from Scorpio. It's just, it's, it amazes me. Like um, even climbing a mountain, like you were, you know, we're getting these requires the pelvic, you know, uh incline you're on incline so you're really engaging the pelvic which is where we are on the anatomical zodiac as well 
it's so fascinating how much it can be unpacked out of just the sign of Scorpio. And then uh, Cody's comment about cavitation, they say that if you put a Scorpio, a scorpion in a ring of fire, it will sting itself. So it has this like fascinating correspondence to the idea of, go, you know, going within. Yeah. The, okay. So the pel the pelvic region of the Zodiac too, not just fasting and eliminating the parasites, fasting your food, but eliminating and fasting other carnal things, because here we are in the sign of the Zodiac where Halloween occurs and there's this famous lifting of the veil of spirit, right? And that makes a lot of sense with the spirit, but, and fasting brings us closer to spirit, but also uh, fasting from other carnal desires as well. So there's this kind of thing that I think caught on in the last few years, which was like um, saving your sexual juices in the month of November, right? I think it's called like no fap November or something like that. No, not November. Yeah. This, and this also season, don't shave, you know, use that extra testosterone to really grow a good beard. Right. Exactly. Right. And, uh, and men, men's sexual health and all this stuff, but even the scorpion itself looking, you know, the, the, the picture of the scorpion, its tail coming back in on itself, you know, bringing its energy back up and uh, connecting that energy that had went all the way down and manifested all the way to the, to our pelvic floor, our energy centers. And, and, there's that carnal desire to, or that animalistic desire, that base animalistic desire to spend that energy like Judas, you know, got some coins, but instead bring, uh, bringing that energy back up, transcending that energy up through the Kundalini up through itself and that, um, and having that, um, developing that, um, energy exchange again. And I think that's really cool. The scorpion is a great symbol of that, but also, I feel like the time of the year is really ripe for this type of um, deep dive and letting go of, uh, you know, things like that, like stop watching porn, things like that, you know, <laughs> maybe yeah. do that one year round though. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That, that will help. <laughs> That'll help with a lot. <laughs> Excellent points, dude. I love that. Uh, I'm kind of reminded. I don't have the visuals off, you know, just right now to be able to show or whatever. But uh, it reminds me of the death card, which corresponds with Scorpio being 13. And then right after that, right, is the art card, which is 14. And uh, the art card has this cauldron right in the middle, you know, and the cauldron itself, when you're talking about water and obviously the uh, traditional Mars correspondence with Scorpio, I do think of a uh, warm sort of a uh, watery situation potentially of a cauldron and then i think of the breaking down that happens within a cauldron i think of putrefaction and negretto the blackness you know the alchemical process um that corresponds with scorpio but within that card there's this cauldron and then there's this energy that just flows from it you know so it just kind of reminds me some of what you're saying you know this uh energetic quality that has descended um, but has the potential to come out and to flow and everything else. And at least in that card, it's actually the arrow of Sagittarius that's coming out of the cauldron itself. Um, so when I think of Scorpio season, I do think of the cauldron and it does have a nice sort of overlapping theme, right? With like Halloween and things like that. Love it, man. And I will say for me, at least on a personal level, it has been a huge, there you go. Nice. I love that card. It's so beautiful. And didn't but, didn't we decide that Artemisia is encoded yeah. in the name of this card? Art. Yes, I remember that from the from the vibrant. Yes, totally, totally. That is the gift that just keeps giving. I love that <laughs> connection. That's so fun. Yeah, that's awesome. But uh, I've been like totally working on releasing. Like I'm like uh, just all the things that don't serve me any longer. And it's more for me, it's been on an emotional level. And I feel like that's fitting for Scorpio um, for sure. So that's just been a theme ever since the eclipses and everything came through. That was like my main theme. <laughs> so we're going with that. <laughs> it's been going good. Uh, it's never fun sometimes, but you know, you got to let it go. You, you don't know you need to let it go until it surfaces. So um, it brings it up. That's what Scorpio does. There's like secret depths and stuff going on. So another interesting Scorpio weave to add to the mix. I brought this up in my episode on the uh, Heaven is the Sky solo show I did, but that was, isn't the plus extension, so maybe not everyone saw it, that you have 
the uh, mythology of the pregnant virgin. And interesting is that you have in Aquila, let's see, back up maybe. In Aquila. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the eagle Aquila's cuneiform spelling, Eru, also meant to be pregnant. It was like a double meaning word. So right next to the virgin or close to the virgin, you have the pregnant, a word that means pregnant. And then interestingly, in the book of Revelations, the uh, the woman of Revelation, uh, who is like being chased by the serpent or the dragon, I should say, she's given the wings of an eagle. And, uh, you know, it's, she's also made pregnant in this story. So it's interesting. Virgo is depicted with wings. And those wings maybe have to do with the proximity to the Aquila constellation that also meant pregnant in the uh, cuneiform in the Sumerian. That's right. beautiful, dude. I love that. That makes sense, too, because uh, when we're dealing with Virgo, we're dealing with one of the astrological signs. That's an emglyph. Right. And then you have Libra and then you also have Scorpio, which is an M glyph as well. So there is this really fascinating relationship between Scorpio and Virgo. Uh, you know, symbolically, I think uh, the virgin and the whore would kind of be appropriate for a few different reasons. You know, uh, the woman of light and then the woman of darkness or the scarlet woman, what have you. Right. So, yeah, that's really, really intriguing. If you if you got pregnant during Halloween on Scorpio, I guess. Um, the scorpion becomes born of the crab. So it takes on, you know, it's like, it's almost like the crab, the crab and scorpion have very similar characteristics. They have that armor, they have the claws. Um, and I don't know, it's just, it's pretty interesting too. And another thing is if you happen to be like one of the, uh, solar savior mythologized characters who was born mincy decimo or in the 10th month like krishna and jesus and julius caesar and many many others i could name uh then you'd have a leo baby would be the king <laughs> born during this you know from a pregnancy in scorpio season if it was a 10 month pre pregnancy like a lot of the saviors are huh. nice well one slide down <laughs> yeah one slide <laughs> doing great everybody 40 minutes <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> uh, we'll keep moving yeah we're having fun here here's another artemisia so a different species artemisia absinthium you name you get the name absinthium you you hear absinthe which is the uh beverage of that's what I'm drinking tonight. No, I'm just kidding. I'm drinking some Damiano, which we'll hopefully talk about. Um, but um, I had a fun quote from Culpepper here from Culpepper's Herbal um, about Artemisia um, absinthium or absinthe. And um, let's see here. He says, uh, relates the following curious story about Mars and Wormwood. So Quote, when Mars was free from war, for he loves to be fighting and is the best friend of a soldier has, I say, when Mars was free from war, he called a council of war in his own brain to know how he should do poor sinful man good, desiring to forget his abuses and being called an unfortunate luminary. He musters up his own forces and places them in battalia. Oh, quoth he, why do I hurt a poor silly man or woman? His angel answers him, it's because they have offended their God. But back to Adam. Well, says Mars, though they have speak evil of me, I'll do good for them. Death's cold, but my herb shall heat them. They are full of ill humors, like parasites. Uh, else they would never have spoken ill of me. My herb will cleanse them and dry them. They are poor, weak creatures. My herb shall strengthen them. They are dull-witted. My herb shall fortify their apprehensions. And among astrologers, all this does not deserve a good word. Oh, the patience of Mars. So this is a very Martian um, uh, cleanser. So here we have Mars again. Um, and it also has, again, it's Artemisia. So there's this moon aspect. There's this Venusian aspect, very soft and, and delicate. But uh, the signatures that we can find in the plant in, in nature are through our senses. When you taste this herb, it is very warming. It's very exciting to the senses. It's extremely aromatic. 
and it's very, very bitter. So plants that are aromatic have a way of diffusing energy outwards and they bring our energy out to our periphery, whereas plants that are bitter bring our energy back to our center. So it has this very interesting dynamic back and forth between um, outwards and inwards. And of course, it's a very famous vermifuge. And the reason why I included it is because of the term that you brought to my mind, which is louche, which is the... Um, what we see here on the right, when you add uh, a distilled spirit of the Artemisia, um, fermented Artemisia, which is a, an amazing um, uh, aperitif and very common in a lot of places in Europe. And um, you add that, uh, you put a little sugar cube on top and you add icy water until the um, beverage becomes cloudy and unclear. And there is a, um, um, anto, uh, here's the word I was looking at, anti -noc anti uh, effect, which is uh, against pain, you know, against the perception of pain. But I also noticed in that word anti nociceptive, as in it's against knowing and gnosis as well. And I think it's that's like really you, you're in pain either way, but now you don't know it. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. You don't know who to blame. It's not, you're not sure if it's the demiurge or who. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think, and then also this plant, as it gets older, it has a very bur burgundy reddish uh, Martian stem and it works on the blood again. And it definitely has a lot of these plants that we're talking about have a movement to work of that warmth and the energy downwards to the pelvic floor. There's a lot of plants that move up, um, that move up or that move out and these plants warm downwards. And that's, um, that's definitely a signature of Scorpio in my mind. Nice. Yeah. Well, we got into the absent thing. I feel like it was almost a year ago. Exactly. When we did the, the big master weave on like the wizard of Oz which, funny enough, came up this morning in the Interverse Telegram. Uh, the Wizard of Oz popped up, like, right on schedule. Uh, in, uh, and I corresponded uh, um, the Wicked Witch being looshed. When they splash the water on her, she dissolves. It's like a, a big looshing uh, event, uh, ritualistically. And uh, Absinthe was illegal for 100 years. Uh, and Hemingway was a big fan of Absinthe, and he has a famous poem about Absinthe called Death in the Afternoon, which is pretty interesting because the death card corresponds with Scorpio also. So that's that's a whole lot of a whole lot of fun packed into this subject. And then there's the silver screen experience where we eat sugar and put ourselves in a passive position to get looshed when we watch film. Yeah, another right. name for this plant is uh, silver art silver mugwort or silver artemisia or silver wormwood so as you can see Ooh. by the summer silver and green i love that very cool uh one thing i'll say about absinthe i was really surprised um you know my night vision isn't so hot and so um just seeing at night is kind of difficult for me but after a night of drinking absinthe um my pupils must have been dilated because I saw way better at night and it wasn't just like a full moon or anything like that. And so it was very, very noticeable to me just the amount of information I was receiving with my eyes. And so in that way, it kind of felt like some psychedelics where I just felt like I was a little more wide open. And I think it was an actual perception thing, but I'm wondering if it was something else. Um, I don't know if you have anything to say about that, Kyle, but I thought that was really interesting. One of the times I uh, drank absinthe. Well, you know, funny enough, but eagles have pretty strong eyes. I know Scorpio is not correlated to the eyes, but they do say if you uh, if you are too <laughs> a lib too much uh, liberal loosing of your own male essence, then you might go blind. <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. I d I didn't know that about the eyes, but I have this other interesting fact about. Um, wormwood that Culpepper also mentions is that if you mix um, wormwood into the into your ink, that mice will not eat the paper. So um, again, there's this uh, many uses of on the physical plane of preventing parasites, prevent preventing the um, you know 
vermin, if you will, yes. and also maybe being able to um, bring call to our attention these things, which are typically reside in dark places, you know. So I'm just being, I'm, I'm just imagining here, but um, but I think that it's it definitely has an association with getting out from the nooks and crannies and the dark places in our body as well. So maybe uh, that has something to do with the eyes as well. I think it's pretty Gosh, cool. That is fascinating. Uh, so uh, I, I got no receipts on this. It's just hearsay. It's just conspiracy trivia. But they say that uh, after certain dark initiation rituals that might have involved kissing the ass of certain parasitic animals, might have involved toxoplasmosis, mind control, that the initiate, if they had, if they were not uh, chosen uh, or selected, that they would be taken upstairs or to the bar, and they would have a congratulatory toast of absinthe, and they would be told that they were chosen, and then they would be sent on like a kamikaze suicide mission because they're in the club now. But in fact, it's a it's a dead end, and so the guys who are like, yeah, afterwards they'd be like, yeah, I'm in the club that we had some absinthe and it's official. They're like, nah, nah, nah. They, they wouldn't tell them, but it, they would know that you really didn't get in the club. You just think you are. So that's very interesting. And that means that they're, uh, uh, they're a rat. <laughs> they're, they're expendable. So I'll throw that. All right, we'll do another slide. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Unless unless someone else has something to add to all that, which is totally cool. No, I'm ready to move. Move on. Cool. All right. Partners well with cannabis. It does. Now, Damiana, uh, this is a um, plant ruled by Mars, um, and it, it has more of a masculine energy, I would say. Um, I love this plant for so many reasons, but it was one of the plants that actually propelled my study of herbalism and got me into finding herbalism as a study, basically. And Mario, I have to thank for that because he was doing research on smoking herbs, right? And he told me about Damiana and he's like, hey, let's, uh, I want to go get some uh, Damiana. Let's go to this herb shop, right? And I'm like, okay, cool. And this was in Portland. And so we went and we just dove into learning about Damiana. And from there, I ended up like going back to the herb shop and getting an internship. And then I ended up started working there and it was this whole thing. So Damiana was a huge gateway for me. Um, and I love it for a lot of reasons. But one of the things I love about it is its calming properties, but it is stimulating in its own way. So it's an aphrodisiac. And it was known in the Mayan and Aztec cultures as a sexual reproductive tonic. So they would drink Damiana tea, or I'm sure they had other concoctions that they would make with it, but they would um, consume this when they were trying to conceive a child. So it was something that would arouse both partners, get them excited, and it has the fire energy. Um, and I just love the shape of this plant. And um, it's beautiful for helping people who are trying to heal from sexual assault, um, the PTSD from that. Um, I think because it is so um, nurturing to the reproductive organs and system that it um, it's just a really good ally for that. Um, and when it's smoked with cannabis or by itself, um, it's really calming. But I love the signature of the leaves because the leaves look a lot like a cannabis leaf. Um, and that was one of the things that we started doing with it was mixing it with the cannabis because it kind of takes the edge off of cannabis. Um, there, you know, a lot of people, sometimes they'll smoke and they get a lot of anxiety. Um, when you mix the Damiana, it kind of takes that away a little bit. So if there's somebody that, or you're wanting to maybe smoke less or something, you could roll up a cigarette with Damiana and uh, cannabis. And it's a good way to kind of like, you know, taper your usage back as well. But I just think this is such a beautiful plant and it's native to Mexico. So a lot of times it's referred to as Mexican Damiana. And there's also a liqueur that they make uh, from Damiana. And I'm not 100% sure what it's called, but the bottle, it like looks like the torso of a woman. So if you ever are in a liquor store, um, they, they don't, not every liquor store has it, but um, you could probably look it up online and find an image of it. 
I love that. Uh, is that the Latin name? Ternera Ofusa? Diffusa? Yes. Yes. It kind of, it kind of, Twilight speaks to me as like, never turn away because it has different uses. Ternera Diffusa. Hmm. Yeah, I could see it, man. That's fun. For it's some reason, cool. this all made me think of the uh, I Ching hexagram 59 which is dispersion or dispersing. And it's like the idea of, uh, you know, dissipating negative energy, releasing, grounding, saging, all that type of idea. And I haven't found like a system that convinces me of what should correlate to what with the I Ching, but some correlate dispersion, which is a word very similar to diffusion with uh, Virgo, the Virgin. Hmm. Interesting. That's cool. Yeah, that is intriguing. Yeah, because when I and when I see diffusa, I think of diffusing a situation. And so I like I'll say again, this is such an ally for anyone who's trying to get over, even if it's not sexual assault, any sort of hang ups in the realm of sexuality. Um this is this will be your best friend. I mean, I uh, just from personal experience, having it around as tea, even just having the jar of Damiana around, um, it, it's it's beautiful. And so I look at the diffusing, like it's you're diffusing that situation, whatever it was. The Damiana will come in and kind of diffuse that for you and help you to just get down to the deeper, you know, meanings of what's going on and everything else. That's cool. You know, uh, somebody mentioned, uh, who was it? I think it was, yeah, Family Fun Guy was saying that it's got the five petals correspondent to Venus. And also the death card has the five petaled flower on his flag. Uh, yeah. So very correspondent to that Scorpio signature position. That's cool. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yes. Sorry, I missed that, Michelle, but I. Um, I, I'm back. Um, oh, yeah, I did, you're good. Yeah, I made this slide. I, I did want to bring that up because a lot Sweet. of our plants that have this uh, Martian rulership have a lot of Venus activity going on with them. And it actually, um, am I here? I don't know. I'm frozen again. Okay. Your video is no, um, hear you, though. Like, yeah. One of the things I think that. Okay, cool. Well, that's fine. Um, uh, one of the things I think that a lot, unless it's like a super assert, assertive Mars looking. Dynamic between both. No, again, now you are breaking up. Unfortunately, he's yeah. breaking up. He's dispersing. Yeah, <laughs> he's diffusing into the internet ethers. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to hear this. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, we'll, we'll get him back. All right. I, I will riff off of what he just said, though, regarding the Mars uh, Venus sort of thing, right? Uh, it's really fascinating that this is like the flower, the rose, the white rose tends to come up, the five petaled rose with the death card. And Scorpio is opposite Taurus. So that is the pairing is Scorpio and Taurus. Taurus is ruled by Venus. And Venus in the night sky, from the perspective of Earth over eight years, creates a five-petaled flower known as the Venus Rose or the Kiss of Venus or the Venus Pentacle even. So to me, that's just like really fascinating that there's even that correspondence um, with all of that. But Kyle, you are back. So go for it, dude. Yeah, cool. here's a, the Venus Pentacle for anybody that maybe hasn't seen that before. This is the pattern Venus will make over its eight-year cycle. Yeah. And it manifests that pattern downwards into from above into existence. And it has that same frequency and it plays that on the, on the plants and the Martian aspect of creation also manifests the um, things like the way that it moves blood and the aromatic qualities as well. Um, and so I think it's really interesting that on all of these death cards, we see the death of, um, of the, our previous sign, which is Libra, ruled by ruled by Venus, and we have the two door 
or the Rose of York um, from the Death Card in the Rider Waite. Um, he's carrying this, and it's not as if uh, it's not as if death killed Venus. It's as if death is like um, present for Venus's um, falling. And this is the way I interpret it. In the middle death card, some random deck, I see a, a five-petaled flower, a, a white rose again. And then here in the Thoth deck, on the very bottom center underneath his knee, there's a five-petaled rose right next to the scorpion there too. So Mars taking over. Mars, the Martian aspect in our living world is in Aries. And we have the above ground world, right? And it's the initiate of the living world. And now we have Mars going into the underworld, initiating the, the death cycle and the life within the underworld. So to me, I think about like all of the, the critters that are underneath the leaves and the mycelium, um, that family fungi <laughs> that James from, and at least from family fungi are creating. And all of, the, all of the things that are happening in the underworld, the life that is happening there, and the Martian initiate of that, um, of that process and through Scorpio. I also am reminded of the Trinity aspect of the destroyer, which is also the regenerator. The same person of the Trinity is both destroyer and regenerator. And so here we have in the Scorpio and in the body, you know, at the same level of the body is the organ of generation and the area of elimination or destruction. Excellent. Excellent. Awesome call, stuff, man. guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is great. Uh, just because we have these cards up, you know, I want to acknowledge the scythe and how he's harvesting souls, you know, and um, the harvest season sort of connection with that. Um, also a really intriguing thing that I am really fascinated with right now is what Crowley did on the right hand side, right? With that card. Um, to me, it's really kind of nuts that someone sent me the other day, uh, this image of death and apparently it's from this 18th century cathedral and death as, um, as a skeleton is blowing bubbles. And it reminded me immediately of this card how there's these bubbles, you know? And so to me, I just think of uh, birth being, you know, the other side of death, right? Two sides of the same coin, essentially. And you know me, people who follow my work, uh, I think that's a clear axis, Mundi, world axis, world tree sort of representation coming out of his pelvic region right there. Um, th that is the pole, that is the phallus. And, you know, this is the journey to the afterlife, in my opinion. So also uh, Crowley did put in the three aspects of... Uh, of Scorpio. So you see the scorpion, then you see the serpent, and then you see the eagle slash phoenix in the upper left. And then also there is a fish there, which I think is interesting. Because if I'm not mistaken, the Hebrew letter that corresponds with this card is, is, uh, is it noon or mem? I know it's one of the two. Uh, hold on, I got it here. I think it might be noon, which is fish, right? None? Uh, fish, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just think that's cool that he decided to put that in there. Yep, so you got it. Quick thoughts. Also, I know that there is something going on with some death cards and the wrists and their hands being backwards. Yeah, it looks like anatomically uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, it does. So I haven't unpacked all of that, but I do think that's intriguing. That is a weird one. Hey, you want to know something that I was only uh, however many days old I was on Sunday when I learned and somehow <laughs> observed? <laughs> uh, a lot of you might be today years old or today or uh, today days old, what have you, when you find out that penis is an anagram for spine. <laughs> How did we miss it? How did we miss that this Dude, whole time? Dude, yes. I love oh, that, man. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Thank you for that gift. Thanks, Marty. That was a Marty Leeds droplet of Gnosis. That's, That's why, we go to, why do I go to his Sunday Absolutely. sermons, man, for little things like that. Man, I, that is so, that's so juicy. <laughs> I love it. The other thing, too, uh, just because we're looking at the death card, I've noticed um, maybe... Uh, you guys might have something to say about this, but Scorpio, Skull, Scratch, Scrape, you know, I've just noticed the sk 
sort of sound. And I think that's kind of intriguing for a few different reasons. And it seems to all kind of be applicable to, I think of the stinger, you know, of the scorpion and what it does and everything else and the skull. And so I don't know, just thought I would throw that out there. Yeah. That, that, that is interesting. Yeah. Script. Uh, yeah. And even like, I even imagine like what a Scorpio's tracks would look like in the sand. It might be scribbly kind of like this death card, the way that it's got the, kind of squiggly lines going down on that uh the death star uh this is definitely uh darth vader uh encoded nice. yeah yeah for sure also just want to acknowledge the fact that um in the card on the right the crowley card that he is at the bottom of the ocean or at the bottom of a body of water you know corresponding to this um to the water connection obviously with scorpio but uh, I just think of like the pressure of the bottom of the ocean and how dark it is down there, you know, and how it's like a, a foreign place and all of these different types of concepts and stuff. So that always trips me out when I see that. And I kind of just realize that it's at the bottom of the ocean there. That's cool. You know, and, uh, another thing that I think of is square, you know, S. Ooh, nice. S Q R. <laughs> <laughs> instead of a uh, s c r there's some phonetic connection there yeah well let's keep weaving in and see if we can get kyle back in and if he's having connection problems that's all right but i'm going to shoot him a telegram message as well um but yeah somebody drop some observations while i get in touch with kyle yeah so uh just wanted to say too that sometimes scorpio is referred to as the gate of the great mystery which I think is really fascinating and makes a lot of sense. You guys have been talking about initiation, you know, yeah. initiation. I think of initiation into the mysteries. You know what I mean? Uh, so I think that's really, really appropriate. And then also um, there's a lot to be said about gateways like all over the Zodiac and all over the heavens, you know. But uh, there is a lot to go off of regarding a gateway specifically that relates to Scorpio and Taurus. And more specifically to uh, the uh, royal stars that exist in Scorpio and Taurus, which is Antares, the heart of the scorpion, and then also Aldebaran, which is the eye, the bull's eye, right, of Taurus. So just something to think about. I think when you're looking at the Hierophant card and you're looking at the cross keys, you know, they're um, silver and gold. These gateways have been referred to as the golden and silver gates, too, which I think is pretty interesting. But Kyle is back. I'm happy to see that. Well, yeah. now that you said all that, though, I got to bring up this slide from Vibrant 58. <laughs> Just as like a little reminder of some of the connections to the what you're talking about, because a lot of the goddesses are named Pallas or Arche. And Pallas can, is related to words that have to do with gates and doors, but also phallus. Pallas, phallus, Pula, Pola. Uh, Pala, <laughs> and then RK is relating to head or uh, wisdom or a boat or a yoni. So, you know, when you're talking about the Taurus to Scorpio opposition, there is something going on there. That's holes awesome. Holes. Absolutely, dude. And then I'll just say that uh, there is, I guess, like some discrepancy out there. Um, but my understanding is that and Terra's is very close to looking towards the center of the galaxy. And um, Aldebaran is looking away from the center of the galaxy. Whatever that might mean now. You know, you almost have to update some of these observations. Um, yeah. But that is my understanding, is that when you're looking towards Scorpio, you're looking towards the center of the galaxy. When you're looking at Taurus, you're looking away from the center of the galaxy. And that there's a correspondence there with these gates. Oh, that's great. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the lunar standstill nodes all over the place, but that corresponds to it as well. The, the south node is down here right between uh, with Ophiuchus, right between Scorpio and Sag. And then the north node is right there in Taurus. So it has uh, what some cultures call the south node, the tail and the north node, the head of the, of the, of the cobra, the, the grand cobra. Or some cultures flip that in reverse. So that nice. that corresponds with what you just said. That's cool. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Uh, also, I'll just add uh, this, that uh, some cultures have this idea that you meet an old scorpion woman when you die. And that there's this old scorpion woman at the end of the galaxy, basically, that you um, 
you meet, which I think is intriguing. I've got one for you guys. Please, man. <laughs> Talking about the phonetics of the SCR, SKR, SQR. Uh, you know, what do you people say about making a living? They scrape together <laughs> your wages, right? Well, a uh, Hebrew equivalent that I just thought of is a word that's Eskar or Eshkar. But in terms of the, the letters, it's like Shin, Kof, Resh. And then like, you know, they add vowel points because that's not in the language. But Eshkar is a word referring to payment of wages or reward for services. So <laughs> scraps. But yeah, isn't that what, you know, the Judas idea has to do with as well? Yeah. You know, you, he did it for a reward. And then that's apparently where we get the word succor oh. and, and secure is from this uh, Eshkar word. Oh, damn. That brings in Zuckerberg. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of the Iscariot part of uh, Judas Iscariot, right? As well. Oh, really good one. Whoa. Yeah. 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 This is fun. Is the Ishkariot? <laughs> yeah. Wow, man. Making connections. Well, Kyle, I think you're good. You look like you're good. If you oh, have more trouble, like... wife right now. So, oh, good, good, good. And the baby's good. asleep. So here we go. Um, yeah. So shout the... out Davide. Yeah, Davide. <laughs> good kid. Such yeah, a good a, kid. Um, uh, just turned nine months old. So same amount in, same amount out. Oh, have... Congrats. That's awesome. Yeah, it is. He's uh here. We... I'm playing on the the um, death card again with the rose, the death of the rose. Um, the, wow. um, uh, here we have rose hips. So rose, typically a lot of people think about rose as a very Venusian plant, but again, these signatures of Venus have a lot of Martian signatures too. So here, over here on the right, we have the vestiges of the five pointed star of, of Venus in these wild rose hips. But what's left in the Scorpio season is all weapons and blood. This is a bunch of thorns and a bunch of um, rose hips, which have that basil color. The fruit, things that are fruits that are red and uh, plants that are red have a lot of significance to that material side of the body, not so much of the, you know, spiritual and consciousness side as like the colors of purple do. Um, but, but it's telling us that. Um, I and mean, if you ever watch the show alone, you know, that one of the first things they always do is go out and get some rose hips because they, they, uh, survive through the winter. Um, and so, yeah, very, a lot of Martian qualities for, uh, the rose hips in the Scorpio months. And then the rose hips themselves, um, the word hip is really interesting because it tips us off as to a part of the body that these plant really does work in and it works on loosening up the hips it has a slight mucilaginous property and a toning quality too so it's both relaxing and tightening and it really does that well in the hips so this is a great plant to consume for the uh the virgo that just got pregnant um somehow and <laughs> or any or any pregnant um female really um, for tightening and relaxing the hips and the uterine uh, area as well, as well as providing a lot of nutrition and vitamin C as well and working together in that um, how the, the, the Martian male aspect interplays with in the time of year with the Venusian, the, the almost like the uh, symbolic funeral of Venus, you know? Beautiful, That's man. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just loving how, you know, the Scorpio, Taurus, Venus, Mars balance within these plants. I, I just love it. it it's um, it's so beautiful to me. And uh, I'll just add to one of the things I have in my notes when I was reviewing some of my Scorpio stuff is you have brought up war multiple times. It makes perfect sense with Mars and everything else. Uh, Mars, even too, right? When you flip the M, it's wars. And then Chance, you brought it up many times, but, you know, uh, Mar and then Ram, you know, there's all these fun things you could do with the wordplay on that end. But uh, there's some cultures where literally the word for Scorpio or for Scorpion, excuse me, translates to oppression. 
backbiter and war, which I think is really intriguing. Um, and makes a lot of sense once you understand the uh, energetic quality of the sign and, and all that stuff. Totally, man. There's a lot there. I'm thinking about the whole hips thing too. It's really common in biofield work. I find that people have issues going on with their hips. And so just like a quick tip for anybody that may need a hip tip. <laughs> <laughs> if you find yourself tight in the hips, um, or if in particular, if you can tell more of a an misalignment in the right or the left, your right hip has to do with how much you're pushing yourself to overwork or overdo it based on feeling guilty if you don't, or just in particular, overexerting yourself physically. Uh, a lot of athletes would get the right hip problem. The left hip is going to relate to uh, your fear of being seen or recognized, uh, wanting to hide from the world or being just plain kind of lazy or indolent. And really those two things kind of play together because if you're trying to avoid being seen or noticed, then you're not going to act out in the world as much. So, uh, you know, be aware of like fear of being seen is going to affect your left hip a lot. And uh, your right hip is going to be about feeling guilty and overdoing it, overworking it. Interesting. That's awesome. I always like the um, hip and jaw connection. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but that like the jaw is very much related to the pelvic region and the hips. So if you're like, you know, you tend to hold tension in your jaw or whatever, a lot of times it could be connected to like a pelvic thing energetically whatever physically um but i learned that a few years ago and i found that to be very interesting because i from personal experience i do tend to hold tension in my jaw and i have and i have to consciously remind myself sometimes to like be aware of that and i've also connected it to tension held in the cervix that i've felt before and when i'm very aware and i tune into that, I can tell, I can tell that it's correlated. And I started realizing that a couple of years ago, just as I was like doing dishes one day where I was like, holy crap, I'm holding so much tension in my hips. I'm not even doing anything. And then I was connecting it to the jaw. Then I learned the connection thing. And then I was noticing cervical tension and all this stuff. So it's all very much connected. Um, and so just something to think about if you've ever noticed that in your, in yourself. There's even in physiognomy, there's um, like, for example, if you get uh, women get zits under these particular parts of their, um, this is showing like inflammation during a particular ovary ovulation. So the jaw, like lots of a breakout around here could represent a lot of heat and inflammation in the jaw, or sorry, in the, in the hips as well. But even here is the reproductive organs on the, on the face, correlated in the face. Yeah, that's brilliant. It's interesting how the spine and the vagus nerve connect everything. I was hanging out with Topher in real life over the weekend, which was pretty cool. I got to go see his new home and visit him and his lovely wife and daughter. And I, he was doing some like body work for me to help me with the place where my back was a bit locked up in a shoulder issue that I developed earlier in the week. And at one point, he just had his hands on my neck and wasn't actually doing any massaging, but I felt this heat coming from his hands and spreading down uh, from the top of my spine. And then at a certain moment, all of a sudden, I felt like I felt the energetic connection in my sacral area connect up to the head again and realized, oh, <laughs> the energy was blocked somewhere in the middle of my spine. And there wasn't this like circula circulation of the heat and the warmth and the energy. And uh, when it reconnected the jaw area, neck area, and like the hips, you know, level, it was really powerful. And uh, that seemed to be what did the trick for, for me getting back into full mobility and uh, utility <laughs> with my body. That's awesome, dude. Yeah, let's go pull up the next slide here. We can keep moving. More roses. 
Rose, yay! It was awesome because Kyle and I were on the same uh, wavelength. He was he was doing rose hips, and I was looking at the rose. <laughs> so uh, the flower part, uh, the beauty, the Venus, the very Venetian part of the rose. Um, I just uh, so many people love rose. I'm one of them. It's it's beautiful for so many reasons, but um, I find it to just be really calming um, and also. It's really good because I have it here in the notes. It brings beauty to ugly situations. And that's one of the things that I've just picked up from this plant. And it was a really strong healing ally for me when I was going through my own, you know, healing journey of uh, specifically sexual energy and all of that stuff. Rose was one of my main allies because it just gave me so much comfort. But there's a really a lot of beautiful things about it that I could talk about. But one of the cool things that I love that I was excited to share with Chance because I know you're all about the energy, my brother. But uh, it vibrates at 320 megahertz. And so it is one of the highest vib. It is the highest vibrating flower on the plane. Um, and lavender is uh, second to that. And so a lot of people will say that it's actually the essential oil that has the highest vibratory, um, you know, energy or whatever. Um, and then you can read about people think, saying that if you just drink rose tea, you're going to raise your vibration, which that could be true. That might be true for all plants or whatever. But I love that connection there. Um, and then uh, rose being connected to Venus, Isis, Cupid and Bacchus. So just lots of love energy there. Wine with Bacchus and fertility. Um, I love the sub rosa thing with Rose. And I know Tracy uh, Twyman talked a lot about this as well. Um, but the idea that they would hang a rose even from like a dinner table or if you were having a certain meeting. And so anything talked about below that rose was was to be kept a secret. And so there's even just like old cathedrals or old churches that will have the roses in the ceiling, uh, whether they be like illustrated or they were carved in. And so just like being in a place of secrecy or the rose just being a symbol of keeping this stuff close to your chest. Um, and the rosary being a crown of roses um, is one of the points I also wanted to bring up. But um, I find that when you're working with any sort of trauma, so if you were trying to um, help yourself get over whatever it might be that's causing you some distress, I really like working with the essence of rose. So whether that be like a flower essence um, or I like to make like a rose elixir where you're actually putting the flower essence along with uh, the essence of rose quartz um, and adding that to a tincture or a, maybe a tincture you made of rose or something like that. Um, it just brings so much comfort. And I've given it to friends who have been going through tough times. And I just know that it just brings the beauty to something that just isn't as savory as you might want it to be. I got a rose jingle. Yeah. Yeah. It goes like this. <laughs> rose, rose, I got to go where the rose grows for it's the place that my nose chose. Put it on my grave when I decompose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's, that's that's that chart top right there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, dude. That's awesome. That is glorious. I'm curious about this, uh, um, the vibration. So in my Ayurvedic studies, I've learned that rose is the high, is the most sattvic plant, which is, um another way of saying that it's got the highest vibration i guess but how is this calculated do you know anything about that no mario and i were talking about that i'm very <laughs> curious about that i am i am curious too because i did double check this to make sure that and i learned this a handful of years ago but i wondered if it's kind of the same way you know how you'll see the videos with them putting like um probes into the mushrooms and then you hear the music of the mushroom or whatever mm -hmm. i wondered if if it's something similar but i'm not sure i don't know and you i know, did oh go ahead well, one idea is i know that of all the essential oils uh it requires the most uh just to get a very small amount yeah. so it might just comport mathematically with the fact that if you get like five pounds of rose hips, you'll get like a whole jar of rose hip oil.
but if you put in five pounds of of rose, you just get one drop. So it might be like uh, it might be that simple. Just a thought that your out, your output for your input is less. So that uh, yeah, just a thought. And then also in a olfactory, I think it is like the highest. Like your nose literally tells you it's like has the highest note in the olfactory you know perfume world interesting uh also guys out there if you if there's a girl you like give her rose quartz it works <laughs> <laughs> it's really <That's> strong <laughs> <laughs> carry it around nice in too. your pocket for a little while then give it to them they will totally like you if you do that <laughs> that's rad that's rad <laughs> so on this sub rosa idea you want to know something funny that i just realized the hebrew word for rose one of the one of the conjectured words for rose uh it's where we get the english name susanna but in terms of the hebrew letters the first three are shin vav ra, uh, shin so that's like one way you could transliterate transliterate that would literally be shush oh wow shin, it's like shin keep... vav shin could be nice. s-h-u-s-h shush so it's like keep a secret yeah, the first three letters for the word for rose in Hebrew. So that's kind of interesting. That is because I was just about to say, talk about like hickeys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, when you get an injury, like the red is like an in indication that they're, you know, that brings your attention, uh, maybe to the need for healing or maybe to the need for some sexual healing. <laughs> and then the other word that is said to be rose, but also possibly means lily, is ver red, ver red. So kind of like vernal, vernal, verily, you know, true springtime, and then the word red. So interesting, more language links. But the shush <laughs> for rose to me, I'm like, okay, this is a good one. That is a good one. Very, very interesting. Um, you know, I'm just thinking out loud here. Why, why the secrecy? Why the silence? You know, the sub rosa thing and everything. And you know, um, the 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 feminine, the divine feminine. You know, it's more receptive. It's more passive, right? Versus the divine masculine, which is more projective, and everything. And so, um, you know, I even think of like the queen being throned. And uh, in the court card system, the tarot. So sometimes in certain decks, the queen is throned and everyone else is either standing or on horseback or going somewhere or whatever. But just the role of the queen to be able to be idle and throned and, you know, people are around her working, you know, just like the queen bee in a hive. You know, there's bees she's not seen right as often as the other bees because the other bees actually come out of the hive to go get the pollen and everything else and so uh the divine feminine being more receptive uh the sexual organs being more internal you the know feminine uh, being the private in law and the masculine being the public that's right yep yep all that stuff exactly um and i know that michelle will almost put this in the slide there but i do think it's fascinating that there's a lot of people who have had uh, divine experiences where they sense the presence of, say, the Virgin Mary, and they have the scent of rose in the air. And they swear up and down that there's like no roses around anywhere. But this is definitely a thing, uh, coming across a divine feminine sort of energy, and then rose, uh, the ro smell of rose fills the air, which I think is fascinating. Wow, that is fascinating. Man, I, yeah. love, that. I love that little tidbit. Thank yeah, you smells for and uh, mystical encounters go hand in hand, whether it's sulfur when you run into like faith creatures or rose with the virgin mother. That's a there's a lot to that. Yeah. yeah, I've actually had that happen. And it was years ago and it was in the old house we lived in. And one night I was just sitting on the couch. Nothing's going on even. And I started smelling roses and I was like, what is happening? And I'm like, there's no roses. And it was just one of those things that happened. And then I learned about this and I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't know what was going on. I can't exactly remember like specifics, but it had to be at least five or so years ago. But yeah, I thought it was interesting. And then reading about it, um, it's pretty cool. And That's I want to know what cool. Kyle thinks on that with all he knows with aromatics. Um, yeah. So, okay. Well, first of all, Serena is sitting next to me over here. Um, says that it's... Um, hey. 
Yeah, just bring Serena in. She's, she's, she says hi. She's from great. Her pajamas. <laughs> uh, Next she time. Says, uh, she's from Italy, and she says that Rose is the, is the flower of Mary, and that um, all throughout Italy there's festivals in the month of May of, uh, for, the, for the Virgin, for the Blessed Virgin. Um, but in, um, in aromatics, um, Rose is a, is a high note. Um, and that means that um, the high notes, so I, when I formulate um, an incense, for example, I have bass, mid, and high notes. And the, the bass note is the thing that keeps the groove. You smell it when you walk into a room. You smell it when, when you come back to the room. The mid note in between. And the high note is the really sharp one that kind of catches your nose, but it's really ephemeral and it goes away. Um, it's very volatile um, and it burns really hot because it's very, very high. So that makes sense to me about the vibratory aspect and it, it almost being at the very pinnacle of like, if I were to draw a pyramid of scent, it would be like right at the top there. Um, and then the other thing that comes to mind about it Rose. Rose to the top, huh? Yeah, it, ro it, ro <laughs> it did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, ro Rose and um, Rose, uh, many things of the Rose family, like Hawthorns and, um, and apples, they all have this Venusian symbol, um, but they, uh, and raspberries, but a lot of them have protective implements, not just, I think it's almost like Mars protecting its Venus. And I call it boundary medicine. This is, um, the thorns of the rose are symbolic of the boundary. And to me, it says like, look, I have, I have this abundance of joy, of love, of all of these things that I would like to share with you if you want to stop, but you can't just come and pick me with impunity because I'm going to cut your jeans open. Um, and so you, <laughs> it, tells you it, it basically is telling you like, look, you know, I'm, I'm here to share. I have this great abundance, but, um, but you better watch it. Um, and if you cross me, um, so that's, that's the idea of like the healthy heart. Like, look, my heart is open. It's, it's, it's here for you all. And we see this boundary medicine again with nettles. This is, uh, to me, I also call this awareness. It felt like too good. Like I had to transition there and then I it's ruined it with the uh, explanation. Pro, pro, <laughs> pro, uh, move there. Yeah. Stinging nettles, or, um, awareness medicine. So from also on the boundary, on the periphery of say your farm or of your property, you might find the stinging nettles as opposed to like the, the boundaries of your personal and emotional aspects with the rose which you keep close to your garden and close to your home. Um, and nettles are, this is the plant that you can identify at midnight on the new moon. How? Because it will say, hey, watch it, buddy. You're walking on me and I'm going to sting you and, and you'll feel it right away. These things on the right, these little appendages are uh, hypodermic syringes filled with a, a cocktail of many, many different um, chemicals that they can't really identify. But some of them are formic acid and some of them are serotonin and dopamine. And an amazing punch is packed with the sting of the nettle, which I think is a very Martian plant. This is all very Marsy. Look at the stem. It's got like some burgundy in it there too. The seeds are, are, um, are very present in the Scorpio season. So this is a plant born of Aries and Mars and Aries. Nettle tea is great. That's right. Um, and um, interestingly, the, um, there's a Euphrates name for Antares that I don't know the name, but it's, it translates to Lord of the Seed. So I see a lot of plants that have this strong seed signature, like their seeds are very, very present. They're not hidden. They're not hidden in the fruit. They're present and they're out um, as like almost like a reproductive tonic, right? So um, to me, the uh, the nettle is a this the seeds of nettle are great for our reproductive health. It's the the root of the plant that we can also use for tonifying the prostate, tonifying the uh, uterus, and decongesting the lymphatic system of the pelvic floor. The nettles work amazing through the interstitial spaces of the body, activating the kidneys. Um, and there's this great play between Aries and Libra and Scorpio and Taurus with this plant and all of the Martian and, and um, Venusian qualities. Um, but one of my favorite things about nettle, the nettle sting and the, the way that it relates to scorpion and the, the little stings that we get is that this therapy from um, the botanical name, Urtica dioica, um, we get to the 
this the the name in a second here, but it's the verb to uh, flagellate oneself with nettles is urtication or to sting oh. yourself. Wow. And urtication was a favorite remedy of the Romans and their um, marches away, you know, as they're building all these roads away from Rome, of course, um, that would lead back to it. Um, and they're spreading these seeds um, in all of the ways that a Roman soldier would spread seeds and of, especially of nettles so that when they would get to a particular area, you know, northern Germany, uh, Czechoslovakia, wherever, they'd be able to uh, take a load off, harvest some nettle and sting their their appendages because it would bring life back to uh, them. So this is an amazing plant, the urtication therapy in particular, stinging yourself with nettle. It's kind of a hard sell, but it's a really, uh, in, in the therapeutic world, but it's a great uh, therapy for bringing back, or it's a trophal restorative of the uh, paralyzed and tissues that, are, that brings it back online. So a signature for the scorpion sting. So the scorpion stings itself, whatever st stings you, right? What happens? Never been stung. Uh, maybe we could talk to Gordy about that. I don't know if he's got scorpions out there. Um, but the but when you get stung by a scorpion, it kind of has a paral paralyzing effect. And so um, from other ways that we could think about that, like if somebody just had like surgery and there's anesthesia and they're um, there, something isn't working properly. You, well, you could sting yourself with nettles to bring blood and energy back into that area, or you could just drink the nettle tea, um, for bringing the digestion back online too. So it has a, a trophal restorative, uh, effect as well, just by the nutritional qualities in the tea. So wow. yeah, the urtication is, is a, is one of my favorite things for, uh, waking my, waking my joints up in the springtime when it's time, when the nettles are returning and the, and that phlegmatic um, humors are still stuck within the joints. And it's just like winter is as like deep, deep, deep down. It brings the emergency vehicles all the way down and it says, and it, and it, and it snaps that tension up and out and it lets it express outwards again. Man, that is so cool. That is some advanced knowledge, brother. You just dropped advanced knowledge. Thank you. <laughs> God, I just love that. And uh, I've been thinking, you know, it would be really something if we could bring Michelle and Kyle back on a seasonal basis and just cover this type of information again for spring, for summer, uh, you know? Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Loving it. So, so the the stinging yourself and the Romans definitely makes me think of Opus Day and the self flatulation that they're way into, you know. Uh, Even urtica, urt, it's like hurt without the aspirate. Right, right. Um, and uh, one other thing that I've been thinking about is how um, we're very, we're not in we're not in Sagittarius just yet. We're still in Scorpio. Uh, so we're in like, you know, those early frosts where like you go out and you harvest that harvest your herbs before it's too late. But funny the about, thing about Sagittarius is it looks like a kettle. The shape of the constellation, it looks like a kettle with a long funky tail, but it's clearly kettle shaped. So I just think that that's kind of fun that we're talking about, you know, getting the, the last of the harvest in and then making tea out of it. That's kind of cool. <laughs> totally dude that's awesome um i'm not sure if i already said it but you know um in some depictions it's very obvious of the night sky that the stinger of scorpio and the arrow of sagittarius are essentially symbolically one and the same and that they're basically pointed at each other and there's older versions of sagittarius like i'm thinking of the babylonian version it's called pobble sog um, in some depictions of pobble sog he actually has a scorpion's tail which is really interesting so there's versions of sagittarius where literally that figure has a scorpion's tail and then also i kind of forgot that i have one around but i actually have a little scorpion right here from our property so uh you know maybe one day i'll get stung by one of these guys because Whoa. we do have them around for sure and so uh we saw a handful of them you know over the last year or so and then, oh, okay, oh, yeah, bring that back up. Oh, there man, you go. it's there you go. too cool. Yeah, 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 totally. 
Um, but regarding the stinger, I just want to riff on that real quick. Um, I, dude, Kyle, your information's awesome, man. Um, I really love what you were saying earlier too, before you transitioned to stinging nettle, but it's all, obviously it's all completely relevant, but the whole, uh, boundary medicine with the thorn and everything else. Um, and obviously you're making the connection between the thorn, the stinging nettles, the, the stingers, uh, with the stinger of Scorpio, right? And it's really interesting because Scorpio corresponds with the genitals. There's all of these rituals that have existed that basically are scorpionic in nature that have to do with genital mutilation, you know, and specifically uh, the woman as well. So female genital mutilation, there's a correspondence with that and Scorpio. So I'm aware of the Dogon tribe having one ritual in particular where they call the clitoris the stinger they cut it off and then the blood that comes out is referred to as the venom or poison and it is a direct reference to scorpio and so there's a number of different myths like this um you know men being castrated or circumcised and then saying that it's the blood uh it's it's menstruation blood essentially you know so i just thought i would throw that out there uh, but also, too, just with the rose, how alluring it is, how attractive it is, how gentle it is to have these thorns, too. And just to have that balance to me is like amazing and beautiful. And so that is one of the things that whenever I see the rose with the thorns, it just kind of it's, it's breathtaking that way. You know, that the fact that it has its defenses built in and that they can do some damage uh, and they're very pronounced. But yet, you know, you can't help but want to get closer and, and get a smell. Let's see here. Oh, yeah. Cody's saying you could use uh, nettles to help with jellyfish sting, too. Then what you're talking about with the bow of Sag and the stinger of Scorpio, I will remind everyone that the Greek word for a bow is toxo. Excellent. So, yeah. Also, there are some death figures uh, death deities, uh, including uh, some versions of the death card, where instead of having a scythe, they actually have a bow with arrows. And that uh, the god of death, oftentimes, uh, back in the day, my understanding is that before they had a scythe, they actually had a bow and arrow. So lots of correspondences there, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when the flood comes and brings death to the world... The one who escapes is on an arc, and the Latin word for bow is arc or uh, arcus, <laughs> and right. that also refers to the rainbow because the word refers to anything that bows or bends. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly right. Uh, and the it, dove, the dove that Noah releases at the end of the myth, is interesting because in the Argo, Argo. Constellation, there is a star that has a name referring to dove, and the uh, word for dove in Hebrew is Yuna, which is or Yona, which is basically Jonah, where you get the Jonah and the whale, but that's Yoni. And the Yoni symbolism in Hinduism is often depicted with doves, so um, there's a lot of correlations there. Uh, so, uh, Joshua LaBranch would speak up right now and remind us that Taxan is a ribbon which is much like the death card is carrying a banner with the with the the banner is like a ribbon you know uh, a standard uh flapping behind him in the wind uh and i just uh i'm reading uh the new atlantis by francis bacon today and uh was reminded of the fact that actually a an archery shot it was considered a unit of measure. And so they would actually, I forget what they, I think they call it a shot away. To be a shot away is actually a unit, a standard unit of measure, uh, which I actually think we, uh, which is an arc, you know, it's measured like by a rainbow shape arc. Uh, and I think on this card, you can see there's like, there we go, yeah can see there's like an arc here and then there's another arc there so it would be like two shots almost interestingly i love that dude i've never heard of that a yeah. unit of measure that makes so much sense too i mean the military comes up with so many different 
tools that we use all the time and they're you know the military's advancing technology and everything else and you know um obviously i know you're an archery guy right but uh -huh. archery was like you know having a bow was like that was the preeminent weapon for a very 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 long time right right and uh uh absinthe is in a shot glass which is also a unit of measure oh, nice yeah oh, yeah, yeah. great all right we'll keep moving all right lemon balm so this one uh we got more venus energy some say too that it's ruled by the moon i uh, tend to think that there could be dual rulership here um but i feel a venus energy from this planet i feel a moon too but um it's one of my favorites and it's a pretty common one. It's a mint. It's in the mint family. So it's very calming as most all the mints are. Um, this in particular, I find to just be uh, a really great um, uplifting herb. So for uplifting to the spirit, um, uplifting to just anything that's happening, um, it ha it pairs really well with mugwort, actually, I've, I find, because lemon balm has the ability to stimulate the mind and the memory. So I like to combine the two because if you're like trying to work, do dream work, do dream recall, lemon balm could actually help, you know, call in your the memories of your dreams a little bit better. Um, at least that's what I've found working with it. It's super mellow and calming. Um, it's really, really well known actually as a ally for children who have ADHD or have a heart, even adults too, who have a hard time focusing um, because it can just really focus your energy and focus your mind. Um, kind of going back to the elimination going on with Scorpio, this is a really great herb for digestion, the digestion system in general, um, it can be used even as like a bitter tonic. It's not necessarily bitter, but I find that it does the same thing as a bitter would by stimulating um, digestion and just soothing the stomach. Um, Paracelsus called it an elixir of life. And this, this herb lemon balm is highly regarded by a lot of alchemists for this reason, because it was thought that it's, it's such a gentle herb that it can be taken as tea every single day and is thought to like revivify you and just like allow you to quote unquote live forever sort of thing. Super sacred to the temple of Artemis in Ro and the honeybees. So uh, the cool thing about lemon balm is that the scent it's like the same pheromones as what the bees give off. So they're really attracted to it. Um, and so it was very sacred to Artemis too, because um, the bees favored lemon balm over many other herbs. Um, and so even beekeepers, they will um, plant lemon balm near or around where the hives are and the bees just really love it. Um, and so, yeah, the volatile oils is what mimics the pheromones um, that, um, are responsible for the communication of the bees. So find that to be very interesting as well. And I, again, I keep coming back to the healing aspect of everything regarding like sexual, like the healing of sexual trauma. This is another herb that I found to be very helpful with those things in general, because it's so calming. There was a time where I did not leave the house without a bottle of lemon balm tincture because it brought me, um, it grounded me. It, it just brought me a lot of comfort during times of discomfort. Um, so that, that's been my theme actually for this whole presentation was just really trying to, um, focus on herbs that I know of that are really good for healing. Some of the, um, darker aspects that Scorpio can bring that, uh, a lot of people like to keep hidden and we all have, we all do it. We've all done it. It's okay. But I think that part of the connection that I'm trying to make with Scorpio and these herbs, particularly the, the ones ruled by Venus is that the plants want to help you bring these things to light. And I think that, um, doing it gently, doing it slowly is the way to go. And just for anyone who's like working with this kind of stuff, it's, uh, it's okay. And, and the plants are here for you to do that. And the, the connections that can be made with these astrological signs and the times that we're in are super crucial. And if you're willing to go there and work with it, 
it, it's here for you. So there's my little like <laughs> plug for allowing yourself to to heal from some of these darker things that a lot of times we don't want to you know, we don't want to talk about, but that's why I love Scorpio so much. Um, because, because of this, because it, it's healing these things within ourselves are major, major keys and major ways to step forward and to release the things that no longer serve you, uh, to release the attachment you have to these traumas or whatever it might be that you find you identify with that actually, you know, it's about, it's about healing it and integrating it. And I think that that's what, um, a lot of this stuff is, uh, is guiding us to here here sex and death that is scorpio season it is <laughs> can't deny it. <laughs> it you know the bees have the stinger just like a scorpion yep. indeed yeah that's great and they are powerful little beings <laughs> yeah, another interesting play. part of the axis between the bee and the bull would be that the word in Latin for bees and beehives and beekeepers, like the apiary where you keep bees, is very similar to the apis of the Egyptians, which referred to their sacred bull or cow. That's right. Yeah, exactly right. Kyle, what were you going to say? Um, I just re I really appreciate the... Um your approach to this, Michelle, because I think, uh, again, here, just expanding the understanding of Scorpio through um, as a pair with Taurus. And this is something that Mario um, and Chance talked about in that chaos presentation a few weeks back too. Um, and just bring breaking the Zodiac down into six pairs. And then, and then as far as the herbal remedies, we don't just think of them as like the remedies for the Scorpio season. Or we can also think of things that are like sympathetic to the Scorpio season that bring out the, um, the lustiness, like in the case of Damiana, or that like um, help with the, um, the lovely, um, you know, aspects that something like uh, lemon balm can help like bring that like brightness back, that clarity uh, from the season. Um, in, in the Ayurvedic tradition, there's three doshas and the, and the energetic patterns that, that, um, you know, fractalize, you know, from the, the, the things that we are, that our constitutions, but even the time of year. And we're moving into the, the season of the air and ether, which is called Vata in, in uh, Sanskrit or the Ayurvedic word. And so things are getting drier. Things are getting, uh, colder. And as we move into the Vata time of year, people with a Vata constitution like myself um, become even more cold, even more dry. And it's really great to rely on herb and Vata really has a strong effect on the nervous system too. This is where it kind of lives and manifests and plays out. So it's really important um, for the Vata, the health of the Vata to, to have uh, nervous system remedies that are warming and brightening and grounding and heavy and things that are against that uh, that pull of the air and the dryness. And so uh, cold pepper, you talked about um, Melissa or lemon balm as um, he said something like um, it dispelleth the melancholic vapors of the heart, you know, something like that. And the, I think that there's herbs that are really like blasting their brightness. Um, but that would be really um, difficult for somebody who has a lot of that nervous tension and or is feeling really uh, tense from the season. And so something like lemon balm is just like sunshine uh, on the fog. You know, it's not like the fog horn that's blasting the fog away. It's this like beautiful brightness that just lifts that melancholy and makes you feel, you know, uh, kind of uh, with it again on a, on these gloomier days as it gets gloomier and gloomier and gloomier. And this is really important for um, people with the Vata constitution to work on through this season, because it can be really difficult for people to um, spiral, you know, in this time of year. So um, I love lemon balm for that. And I love um, these other herbs that we're talking about 
for our nervous system, as opposed to a, a lot of the other nervous system herbs, which can be really cooling, really drying. So Damiana being warming, making us feel good in the base region of our body, which is where the vata should be at this time of year. We're out here, uh, all these thoughts, all this stuff, ooh, bring it down um, with the warmth in, inside of our body. And that feels really good. Yep. Love it. Yeah. Dude, I'm loving this so much. <laughs> this is so awesome. Oh this my is God. really good. Uh, I'm going to keep us moving. Yes, go for it. I don't yeah. want, I want to respect everyone else's time. I mean, I'm fine on time personally, but <laughs> the whole panel, I don't know. So we'll keep moving. But Kyle, Michelle, you guys are such wealths of information on this subject that I haven't done a lot of study on. And so to just hear you flow state on it is in itself you know stoking the fi the fires if you will thanks yeah here we are yellow dock it's also called curly dock gardeners know it as curly dock rumix crispus crispate means curl and you, you might recognize this plant it's very uh weedy it's all around what i see is the signature again of the burgundy in the in the um, seeds these seeds are grains this is related to amaranth so you can harvest this plant for food and you could thresh it and um, but herbalists like to use the root of this plant and we call it yellow dock because the root is yellow and it's yellow because it's high it's a high source of iron ah there's mars um there he is um so not only is it you know it's not to me it's not necessarily a high source of iron compared to something like beef liver which is very high in iron but what this plant does is it works through the digestive pathways to help us absorb iron and work through the proteins and the iron that we actually have in our body and bring that from the serum into the blood cells. Um, and the plant itself has a toning effect. It's astringent. If you taste it, it's, a, it's also it's very stringent from the oxalic acid. So that tells us it's going to tighten something up somewhere when you taste it. Um, and if you hold on to that feeling for a little bit, it'll, it'll tell you it tightens up your colon. And it also has a compound in it called anthraquinones, which are uh, laxative. So it has this laxative and ton toning effect. So it's something that works really, really well on the colon, especially like toning and lax. So for people who have like, you know, alternating constipation and um, diarrhea, for example, it works through the bile and um or just like hemorrhoids or things where there's a lack of tone in the lower part of the abdomen um or even just like um you know leaky guts kind of stuff and um you know what you can make a pillow out of the seeds as well you can make and that's really cool and so i don't know i think about I'd like this is kind of a stretch but um this time of year i feel like sleepy <laughs> so i like i just thinking like oh there's a pillow right there you can just like put that into a pillowcase and there you go you got yourself a little nap going into the underworld that's all i got this universe is like a pop-up symbolism university <laughs> <laughs> that's great i love that good read so uh if you did make a pillow out of the uh seeds would uh, would it have a scent? Is there like a, a aroma? No, this is not a, not an aromatic plant. Okay, it, it, would it would smell like the ground, earthy. It would like yeah, it would just smell like earthy, right? Nice. Which is probably what you want in the Vata season. But yeah, great uh, food source in the spring, but a really great uh, colon. And um, when the annual turns into the uh, zodiac part of the anus then you got ano and anus at the same time you can use yellow dock i love this i don't know that much about yellow dock so i'm glad i'm getting a little lesson on on this um i'm loving it yeah that idea of turning or using the uh using it to make a pillow is interesting because i know that that would have some transfer effect of the qualities or the virtues of the plant that you would then absorb while you slept even if you weren't ingesting it physically like right you can put mugwort under your pillow totally yep yep and ashwagandha here we are this is um this is my favorite plant because i have again that vata constitution so i've never seen what this like bulb bud looks like it's really 
weird and cool. Yeah, dude, it's in the it's in the Solanaceae family. Solanaceae is the nightshade family, and that's typically ruled by Saturn. Um, but um, I'm kind of putting this in not as a Scorpio plant, but as a plant that's really appropriate for our the season. The botanical name Withania somnifera. You get from that somni, as in it's helpful for sleep. There's Farah again. There's the iron. Or a she iron, maybe. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, um, the red winter cherry is another name, common name for this plant. Um, so there's like this little tiny tomatoes that are in this sheath, very clitoral like signature there. Um, and uh, but it's the root of the plant that is really the virtuous thing that a lot of the herbalists use. It's a great restorative of the. A hormonal cascade and the peaking, the appropriate peaking of cortisol in the morning and melatonin in the evening. So for uh, people who are um, have a have a hard time sleeping through the night, um, not necessarily falling asleep, but sleeping through the night, like they wake up in the middle of the night um, to uh, due to a hormonal imbalance. The uh, cortisol is saying, "Get up and 3 a.m. and um, do something." But it's not up all the way. So ashwagandha is great for that. It's a it's just a plant that has this heaviness. Uh, the word ashwagandha is Sanskrit word for the smell of a horse. So I was I was hoping that I could throw that over and see what uh, Chance and Gabe thought of that. But it's like in particular like the sweaty horse. Um, and so it has a lot of um, sweaty whores. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll let you continue, and then I will say what I think. Uh, that's yeah. So it has, it's like, it's thought of a lot of times as a masculine tonic because it is very helpful for fertility for, um, you know, I have lots of clients who have used ashwagandha to get, um, to, you know, with their partners get pregnant again. Um, people with a, a dude with testicular cancer that was able to, um, uh, get his wife pregnant. So thanks uh, in part to ashwagandha and many other things. But um, yeah, as you were saying, sweaty whores. <laughs> oh, no, I just I'm intrigued. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding about that. But I mean, he did say that it has the signature of the, the woman hood, if you will. Interesting. It's the second time that that body part has come up in the doctrine of signatures here. But in Sanskrit, you switch the letter W to M and vice versa whenever you're going from Sanskrit to Latin. So ashwagandha actually would have also this mag linguistic America. going on. Mag, like, you know, your Magdalene magnetic, uh, mm -hmm. the, the feminine for sure. Mag and gam, you know, if you go backwards with it, gamos, like the marriage. So they're... Yeah, the fertility, the the femininity, the receptivity, the yin aspect of it is very well represented in that word. Yeah, and you know, MAGA caps are red, uh, just like magic mushrooms are red. It's it's a it's fascinating how much uh, innuendo there is to magic. You know, in I can uh, I can totally see how you know. Uh, the Grand Inquisition full of sexual prudes were losing their shit when they realized how magical sex is, you know, and making an industry out of uh, vilifying it. It's uh, well, Yeah, I mean, really, when we're talking about the generative principle, that's the energy that all things come from that does everything. So yep. to tap into that, the most core, simplistic, and essential way to do so would be in the uh, sexual dynamic. I mean, everything is basically derived out of that principle. Yep. That's nice. I love this doctrine of signatures. It really broadens my, my symbolic horizons. It makes so much sense. Once Michelle came across that as like a field of study or whatever, I mean, I signed up immediately and was like, yep, that's it, you know, and there's just so much to gain from that. So I love the fact that Kyle brings that to the table. Yeah, and ditto. so does it so expertly too. Absolutely, we say. So really well. love the teaching that we get from Kyle here. And then, like once you start to see it, it also is such a great like uh, memory device for 
being familiar with a, a plant too and recognizing it even if you don't remember its name you see it new like oh i've seen that before <laughs> i've seen this shape before uh, i know what that pertains to it's pretty cool calendula right. so that is in my no i think i have that in a different tonic i think that's in my lungs one. Oh, nice well, hey, these are these last two are like more supplementary like herbs that I just find to be very healing for um, kind of all the things we're talking about, because they really calendula is ruled by the sun and it is more of a watery plant. Um, so it doesn't have really any connection to Venus or to Mars, but it can be very healing to the uh, pelvic region, to the skin, to any soft tissues of the body, really. Um, so I always like to think it has the warmth of the sun and the flow of a mountain stream, because one of the things that calendula is really great with is helping the lymph, lymphatic system move and the lymph fluid move. And it's also an amemagog, just like uh, mugwort. So it's bringing heat again to that pelvic region. Um, I've found it to be very healing to um, the cervix. Um, so making an herbal suppository with calendula. So like you can infuse the calendula into a base of like cocoa butter and or coconut oil, and you can make your own suppositories. And so it really brings down inflammation if you're having any anything going on like that because it can also it can be drying so it can dry up excess fluid so if you're having some sort of maybe infection or something like that it can be very useful um for anything like that um great for tumors and fibrous cysts specifically in the breasts but if you are working with anything like an ovarian cyst or something calendula could be a really great ally uh for that as well so that was one that I just wanted to throw in there um, if people are looking for more specific things that they can be using. Would that be helpful for like post-pregnancy stretch marks for a woman if it's healing to the skin? I'm trying to relate it to, you know, this whole fertility generative aspect. Definitely. And one of the things it's really classically used for is actually as like a nipple cream for nursing mothers because because it's so healing to the skin so you know a lot of times the nipples will become cracked or you know kind of almost like chapped and you can make a really nice cream with calendula and use it for um for healing that so i okay i see so many things now i didn't even i didn't see this before when we were talking about uh amen amenagog mm -hmm. so uh if you drop the gog, it almost becomes analema. It's missing an L uh, in reverse. A-N-E-M-M-E -M -M -E is almost analema. And the analema is a calendar. And it's the calendula. And the shape of the analema, it, to me, is also imbued in the classic images of the Virgin Mary carrying the son of man holding the, the baby, which is the sun, coursing through the shape of the virgin, the hooded virgin, who is uh, nestling her child in her arms. So I see the analema, I see the calendar, and you said it's a sun, warming sun, flower. All of those things are also wonderfully encoded, I think, in the analema. That's great. I like the calendar aspect because um, it it could be um this can stimulate menstruation for a woman so it can actually help regulate the so calendar a calendar a woman's natural calendar if it's off balance calendula is one of those herbs that can help kind of you know bring help that the, back help the flow yep that's beautiful game yeehaw i love that <laughs> calendula is one of my favorite plants too I, I got a bunch growing and i we work with it so often um, it's par excellent for healing mucosal tissue. So the skin and, and also inside too, but one of its great um, internal virtues is the lymphatic system. And it also has a great way of removing um, hard to remove fungus. And just a quick doctrine of signature lesson on this plant here. Uh, I guess we get the sun too, but we see the in 
this is a compound asteraceae. So all of those little thingies in the center there are all little flowers too. So this is a very complicated plant. It's working on all these different places. And um, so we have the, the orangish yellow, you know, above the, like kind of like in the, in the middle chakra, kind of like in the middle of our belly area that this plant is really wants to work through. Um, we have the color of bile that's been um, moved a little bit through the intestines. So that's where it kind of likes to go. It likes to, it likes to uh, stimulate bile. It's got a little bit of bitterness to it. And then also, so in, in Ayurveda, we have, there's this description of the five different winds or the five different vatas. They're called vayus. And this plant um, kind of embodies them all. We have the one that helps with the digestion. We have the one that helps with um, breathing in. We have the one that has uh, the, the, the wind that brings everything out. So there's the signature of the plant, look, you know, whoops, expanding outwards like the Vitruvian man, all the way out. It has all of this energy in the circle and then outwards too. And then um, you, you mentioned the, the downward energy or the, the minagogue aspect, the calendar aspect, and that's what we would call um, uh, apana vayu. So that's like the moving, the moving down. And so, yes, this is a plant that's really helpful for all of the different movements of, of prana in the body as well. Yeah, and the clue in that word, a minagogue, is uh, men from the Greek menses. Or Latin mincy. Uh, I think I think it's Greek though. I think Latin and Greek actually share a similar word for month, but yeah, <laughs> mincies. Yeah, that's a Greek word. And so when you see that in uh, the name of a plant, you might guess that it has something to do with regulating something that's monthly or monthly. And the, the plant's name is like calendar, by the way, too, but it, I don't know if. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yes, totally. Oh, yeah. That's it absolutely <laughs> is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're moving kind of fast. If we want to stop, if you don't, you guys want to slow me down and back up to one of these things and talk more about it, someone just speak up. Or I'll, yeah. otherwise, I'll just kind of keep us flowing. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> kind of like calendula. <laughs> <laughs> and again, this well, this is the last slide. Um, again, not connected to Mars or Venus, but um such an immaculate healer comfrey and one of my all-time favorite plants um again for its uh well we were talking about boundaries with the thorns comfrey is ruled by saturn which is a total boundary maker and we had another photo we didn't include but if you look at the back side of a comfrey leaf it is totally just like there's all these little sections in it. And it's the boundaries that are making those sections are so pronounced. And you can kind of see it on the top of the leaf. But if you really flip it over, you can it's just like a very pronounced boundary and all these little sections. So it was one of the signatures that I thought you can kind of see it there. It's just like it's almost ribbed when you touch the back of the leaf because it's just so pronounced. Um just pr produces so much uh, like mucilage. you can feel the bones of it yes and then we have yep. the skeletal structure with with saturn and it's a great healer for the bones as you can see down below my last note is knit, it's known as knit bone that's one of its folk um names because it can really help to heal broken bones uh fractured bones anything dealing with the cartilage um and tissues, connective tissues. It's a great healer because it has uh, the mucilage that comes from it. And it's almost like can create like a second skin, I like to call it, because it has this gel-like property that happens to it when you brew it as a tea or specifically like make it as a decoction or even an infusion. And the cool thing with comfrey is you can like do an herbal infusion with it and then you can do a second brewing where you kind of boil it down and it'll make a really nice thick tea you can use this as a fresh herb poultice as well if you um, got injured out in the field or something you maybe rolled your ankle you could literally take leaves it's not uh you know the most pleasant thing to chew on but you can just put these leaves in your mouth chew it and put it on as a spit poultice you can make poultices out of it you know um without spitting and chewing you can do that as well and then apply it to your skin um it promotes elasticity 
and it can reduce inflammation. So again, I've used it as an herbal suppository, specifically comfrey root. I've used um, as a um, one of the herbs in a, a suppository I've made for um, BV, which is bacterial vagino vaginosis, vaginisis, I think is how the second word is described because it is just really um, cooling to the body. Um, Allentin, which is such a cool thing that it produces, is one of the places it's produced in the body is in a mother's umbilical cord. And when I learned that, it just blew my mind because comfrey to me is um, it is the world card in one of the herbal healing or the herbal decks that I have in the tarot deck. And I do, I think it, it has this just like world healer sort of energy because it, it has so many um, just great properties. And if you're looking at the mother's umbilical cord, it's like, well, man, she's producing a baby. <laughs> so this Allentin is providing the baby with everything it needs to develop everything in its freaking body. And so to know that it is such a deep healer of all these tissues and everything that we are, and that our bodies are so highly um, made up of water, and that comfrey just brings that moisture um, that, you know, sometimes we we need. Nice. And also, if you wanted to show that last photo of the, the last slide with that with the flower, I just love the coil of these flowers and it's so beautiful. And again, again, we have the spiral of life right here, you know, in the comfrey. Um, and it's just such a gorgeous plant. We, I, we grow it here in our garden and, um, it is just, I just love it. So near and dear. That's cool. It looks like a fiddlehead fern almost with the curl there. Definitely. Mm. And you know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about like there's so much encoded information in this in this art that uh, you need a specialist, you know, uh, and it's it's almost uh, it almost seems Saturnian in its own right that it's like uh, like come free is like very in, inviting and open, you know, the name that it has on the at first glance. Uh, it's it's like you know come free uh but there's something i wonder about like you know the wise women and the uh the people who have kind of passed this down it's almost like uh there are there are built-in hazards in like counter indicate counter indicators and like wh which time you should take it and which time you should not take it well you would need a good witch to know which is which, you know what I mean? Uh, and so there's like a really beautiful art to the language that you guys are revealing to us uh, tonight. And, and I, I see it uh, as a beautiful thing, a language and a poetry. Um, and I feel like our modern keepers of medicine have gotten abusive with those, with that art, you know, in the fact that so much of modern day medicine is called like, Zamber Zamber Tram and Xylitolic You know, and they use like these really horrifying words such that it's not inviting at all. It's like right out the gates, it's like, you know, has the 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 toxic symbol imprinted into the name of the modern day medicine. Whereas the old medicine was like come free and uh much more poetic and beautiful. And I feel like that language uh is has gone through a gnarly shift and i'm just glad to learn the old ways yeah man well put and uh you know we've lightly touched upon some very minor things but uh when you get into herbal folklore the amount of wisdom that is encoded with some of these traditions and stuff and how they use plants and when they used it and where they grew and like the doctrine of signature stuff like there's just so much to chew on there uh, i haven't even really made it a study at all but michelle passes down some information from what she's reading and i'm like holy shit that actually makes a ton of sense and that's actually brilliant that they encode a whole line of mythology in uh the story of some of these plants and how were they they were used and everything so yeah, yeah, I hear you loud and clear. I yeah, agree. it's at the next level of con like constellation writing is uh, <laughs> the mythology encoded in the herbs. 
Oh, cool. Seriously. This yeah. is the what the logos is about, man. So, it's about so below. Everything is everything. Yeah. 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 What, what would you guys say? Is there uh I'm, I'm was there any correspondence to the Saturnian nature of it and the color of purple? Is there anything For to sure. that? For sure. That's that to me right there is the that's the color of um uh necrotic tissue so there's like if you look more closer to this where the the flower meets the the stem i guess you could say this is like tissue that's becoming you know that's dying and uh, is lacking in oxygen that is definitely the saturnian color and then there was a comment about it uh, causing liver damage so there's another there's like the to me this saturnian signature is more about how it's healing the bones and the bones are uh, the Saturn aspect, Capricorn, and everything like that. Yes. Um, a, a lot of a lot of plants that have like a toxicity or potential toxicity. Um, they tell us with their signatures, but they also might have uh, rulership with Saturn. I don't make the claim uh, that comfrey is toxic to the liver, but it is pretty well known that that might that that is possible. However, there's um, there's a compound called pyrrolizidine alkaloids that, but it's in many plants. It's been theorize that it can cause liver toxicity, but it's never actually been demonstrated. Um, but uh, the, you know, with that in mind, you know, one might uh, avoid uh, comfrey, especially it's concentrated, the pyrolizidine alkaloids are co concentrated in the root and uh, the pyrolizidine alkaloids are more extracted through al alcohol preparation. So if you're using the leaf as a tea, um, I would say that you're probably pretty safe. And also, um, this would be like using comfrey daily and daily, daily for years and years and years that it might pro potentially cause a, a toxicity to the liver. But mm -hmm. anyway, the, the other signature that I see for comfrey too, that stands out is the large leaf, which is the lungs. So this is a great lung moisturizer. Nice. And, uh, yep. Yeah. You know, now, now I'm thinking of like, you know, the typical story of death has his curl, his curled scythe. And he, you know, comes to bring to he tells you to come free when he, you know, snips your soul out of your body and you get to come freely to ascend. You know, that's kind of beautifully poetic. I love that. Yeah. And good point on the liver thing. I know a lot of people get freaked out about that. And uh, yeah, you said it very well because you'd have to consume a lot in order for it to get there. Um, and also sometimes I feel like a lot of these things like where there might be a very slight potential for something like that. I always wonder if they like promote that so that just people get scared off the bat of just like trying elderberry or, and arsenic or whatever. <laughs> right. You know, it's just like, of course, never ignore these things. And especially if you have like liver issues already going on, you know, maybe your liver is not as strong or whatever you would, you know, you should use caution, but it just always, it always just amazes me how many little like tiny fear things that they throw at people, you know, when there's this little slight chance that this plant might do that. Well, that's toxic. Well, you know, the other alternative is really toxic, <laughs> you know, whatever the mainstream allopathic people are going to give you. I mean, talk about side effects, you know, but it's a good thing to be aware of though. Yes, for sure. Yeah. So I think in the word comfrey, there's a lot of interesting, uh, phonetics with fray because we're saying free, they were pronouncing it like free, but it's spelled fray. And I think that the promoting of elasticity and the idea of free is interesting especially with bacchus the free father was what he was called liber pater uh that you know <laughs> bach is a stream or a river that flows and flow is a similar idea to like elasticity or free it's you know able to move and uh so that's fascinating and all of these characters like Frey, for example is a sacral king so that purple color having to do with royalty and priesthood uh definitely associates with the idea of fray too and there's more there i'm sure but yeah Sym symphitum oh, yeah. like like symphony it means come together like bringing together as in bringing together the bone bringing together the wound um that's the other thing too yeah just that's what that means in greek 
It also, I was just going to say, makes sense that Comfrey would be associated with the world card, given its Saturnian connection, because that is generally the planet that's associated uh, with the world or universe card, too. But what a beautiful plant. I mean, oh, my God. When I when she showed me this image, I was blown away. I was like, holy shit. Uh, I just my appreciation for the design of these plants is just like it's just ex exponentially season after season getting higher and higher. Now that we're around a lot of uh, just varying plant life with where we're at and what Michelle grows and everything, everything in our garden. It just literally takes my breath away. And I can't really say that it used to do that years ago. But nowadays, I'm like, God damn, this is like some impressive <laughs> artwork. Seriously. Nature's the greatest yeah. artist of all time. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, look at that. Yeah, yeah. AI art is never going to be able to quite do that. <laughs> it's got nothing on it. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well said, Chance. I agree. <laughs> you know, another thing that was interesting too is that Alentin word, uh, that nutrient, because I came to realize that uh, recently that the, you know, breaking down words and all, you see all, A L, Al, in so many things. And uh, we can't always just be like, it encodes God, because <laughs> obviously it's not really intended that way as a, a prefix all the time or a suffix. And so, uh, in this context, Alan, Ala, <laughs> Allenton, I think that the prefix is referring to the a root meaning grow or nourish, which is still connecting you to the solar and the deity because the sun is what brings the growth and nourishment to the world as the primary source of that. But I thought that may be interesting to consider as well that that <laughs> nutrient that I you said that it's in the umbilical cord, right? So correct, correct. that's that's what's connecting the baby to growth and nourishment. And you have all, which is that root, and then on or an. <laughs> so that could refer to the year, the cycle of the year, or on, you know, another solar word. And then uh, 10, which is a Jupiterian metal. <laughs> so interesting. Mm -hmm. Jupiter expands, grows, nourishes, maybe. Great. Yes. Great point. Yes. Yeah. I see this as a, there's a lot of Jupiter aspects to this plant too. It's very abundant. It grows very quickly. It expands things. You can actually use this plant as a poultice for healing a bone and it heals it too quickly before it gets set. So that's a very Jupiterian quality. I think it's like Saturn in Pisces is what I think about this plant. Oh, mm -hmm. that nice. is cool. Yeah. Now I'm thinking about the, you know, the umbilical cord aspect of come free you know the cycle right. is like cutting the umbilical and the baby comes free of attachment there nice nice i was hoping you would chime in about that <laughs> <laughs> knowing that's your wheelhouse yeah everyone drink placenta <laughs> <laughs> gladly <laughs> <laughs> great stuff guys Thank yeah it's so been a really fun show i would have kyle or michelle or both of you at the same time back anytime and of yeah, course you know you. mario and gabriel you guys know so yeah. uh so Fair. one of our one of our chatters uh rayette twee uh, i don't know if she's still in there but she dropped a bomb on me last week guys a huge bomb it was there all along and i'm just still i'm still giggling i'm still giggling Pla Santa. Placenta. <laughs> Let's drink again. Placenta. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Santa brings the birthday presents and you have your cake, which is the Greek word placenta. Comes down the chimney. Presents. Comes down the chimney with the red bag. And it has everything to do with the uh with the Ursa, uh, the, the Ursa, the bear stars going around wow. the North Pole. That is the profile image. If you think of Ursa, I think Majora in particular, it is a profile image of Santa's sleigh. Oh, yeah, the, dude. Yep. The three stars are the like. Wow. Yeah, it's a plow. Yep, plow or chariot. Yeah. Yep, it's, a, it's the side profile of the deer. Uh, and then the big box is his sleigh going around the world 
dropping off the placenta present. The North Pole. On the North Pole. Yeah. I just, I just yeah, love exactly. that. Hell yeah, it, dude. It's the gift nice. that just keeps giving. And I've said this before <laughs> probably several times already, but you know, the star on top of the world tree that you put into your house, I believe, is the North Star. Yeah, absolutely. To me, that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, and uh, just, to, I mean, this is totally a side weave, but I just, while we're on it, um, I think I was wrapping a chance about this uh, maybe a little more than a week ago, but the uh, the winter triangle is a uh, uh, very distinct triangle right over the shoulder of Orion. And so in a weird way, Orion is much like Santa as well, uh, because he's this large anthropomorphized, very crystal clear, um, deified constellation in the uh, triangle, the winter triangle is over his shoulder. So the winter triangle is much like a bag of gifts over the shoulder of this gigantic hero in the sky. And in the winter triangle, there are many very interesting constellations. There's Monoceros, which I think you know about, right, Mario? The unicorn? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, there's Monoceros. There's the printing press constellation is under Monoceros' legs. And there's a Christmas tree nebula. Whoa, nice. So, so when the Grinch stole Christmas and stuffed <laughs> a Christmas tree in his bag, he was like Orion. Uh, in a really fascinating way. It just blows my mind how many stories are just getting ganked from the sky. Totally. That's <laughs> awesome, dude. Also, I'll just add with Orion. Um, I've heard it speculated. You know, I we talk about the seven stars all the time. The uh, Ursa Major Minor, Pleiades, blah, blah, blah. Orion also has seven main stars to it. There's the three stars of Orion's belt. And then there's the four stars that kind of make up like the shoulders and the lower part of his body. And so some people have made that connection, uh, the seven stars actually being a reference to Orion. So for yeah. what that's worth, you know, but great stuff, man. Yeah, so we fun. have a call in from Gordy. I'm going to play for us. It's a little over a minute. All right. Uh, if it's, oops, I need to redo the screen share. If it is not audible enough, guys that are with me on screen, please let me know. I think it should be loud enough. So here we go. Thanks for the call in, Gordy. I have forgotten to remind people for a long time, but the Vibrant Telegram group uh, is a great place where you can drop us a voicemail with a question or an observation if you want us to put that up on the show. It's working now. Okay. This is for Michelle. Michelle, thank you very much. This is Gordy Two Shoes, and you sent me a uh, one ounce thing of pine resin oil when I had surgery, and that helped a lot. But what was surprising to me is I kept using it for uh, my beard and scalp and it whenever I eat something because I've got all sorts of like dietary weird you know your body reacts once you get rid of all that shit and once you introduce shit back into your body like your body reacts and stuff and mine is always in my hair and scalp and so I've been using that pine resin oil and it works great, man. I whooped it into some, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, shea butter. I got some raw shea butter from this African dude at a, at a farmer's market. And I'm, I whipped some of that pine resin oil in, into it. And it makes this bitchin' beard balm. So, um, Mario, try that. Gordy's bitchin' beard balm. <laughs> nice. I, I would like buy it. that. He nice. should totally nice. go for it, man. I'll, I'll supply the pine resin oil if you are going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> or I'll just teach you how to make it. <laughs> you know, I think I don't. I don't. I feel like Gordy got to the got into the chat late. I don't know if he was there earlier, but back when we were talking about the master but masturbatorial nature of the scorpion, I learned just today that in the Solabuska deck there are characters stroking their beard which which way back in the day was a uh, uh, encoded masturbation 
which is just ah. adorable. It's so cute because if, if that's the case, man, I'm guilty 24 <laughs> seven. Quit Dude. stroking it, Gabriel. Always Especially stroke don't it. stroke it on screen. How dare you? We're going to talk Spill Our Buscatero with Mario in a couple weeks, which is pretty exciting. That's right. Oh, yeah. So I'm I guess stuck that'll on that. come up again. For sure. Dude, to your point real quick, one of the cards in that deck that depicts somebody doing that is actually the my correspondence for the Hermit card. The Hermit as in being in isolation by yourself as in, you know, um, you know a lot of early Hermit symbolism Which and Hermetic symbolism. Virgo the Virgin who doesn't. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Very much related to masturbatory type stuff. So anyway, very, very interesting. interesting. Yeah. Oh, there he is. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the call in, Gordy. I, yeah. We haven't had one of those for a while, and I really appreciate it. I think those are fun. People feel free to call in. But let's uh, let's try to wrap this up. I, I know that we've been here for a while, and it's so much fun. <laughs> but we'll do it again. We'll be back next week. So uh, we'll go around the horn. Michelle, if you want to give closing thoughts and – plug your work and what you have to offer for people, please do. And then Mario, Gabe, and then Kyle to finish us out. All righty. Well, hey, thanks again for having me. And I'm just really stoked to begin this collaboration that's You're going awesome. on. <laughs> so are you. You guys all are. I'm just so excited and I'm so grateful. And I'm grateful that we're connecting Kyle and being able to collaborate. It's really cool. And um, closing thoughts on this is... Uh, just, um, yeah, feel into that Scorpio energy and look for the plant allies to help you feel through it and to help you process whatever it is and to help you integrate the things that come up for you during this time, because, um, each sign has its specialty, uh, but Scorpio goes deep. So kind of allow yourself to go deep. You too. You're awesome too. Family fun guy. Um, and yeah, so that's my closing thought on that. Um, I You can sign up for my newsletter. It comes out every month on the full moon. Uh, my full moon offerings uh, this month is my uh, elderberry and reishi syrup. So you can, uh, thank you, Rel. You can head to my website and you can sign up there, michelleshealinghome.com. Um, I'm going to make an announcement tonight that I am going to be starting my own podcast. So my first episode is, wow. yeah, and I will say I've been so inspired by this whole community and being invited on shows and talking. I've been wanting to do this for so long and I'm just like, we're going to hit go, man. We're going. So, um, yeah, so that will uh, come out on the 22nd. I'm going to do a, uh, introduction episode where, um, I'm just going to, It'll just be me, but it'll be on uh, the 22nd on Tuesday. And then on the 29th of November, I have James from Grounded Extracts, who I'm very excited to talk to. We had a really great conversation here on Vibrant back in September, and I've been He's wanting been to- He's been here in the chat on the Rockfin side. He's been with us tonight. So what up? Awesome. Shout out, James. What's up, James? I'm lo so looking forward to talking with you and continuing our conversation. So we will see where this all goes. Um and yeah, so that's my my big announcement that I'm happy to share. I'm gonna also gonna be talking to Elise from Family Fungi as well. Um, that's gonna be coming down the pipeline. So there we are. Big announcement. <laughs> that's awesome. Do you have a name for the show yet? That's always fun. I'm right now. It's uh, the Healing Home Podcast because my focus is going to be on, you know, a lot of the stuff we talked about tonight: herbalism healing, holistic health, people who are doing those things and um, wanting to learn more. Um, so that's going to be my focus. Ah, Lucas, he's been learning about plants while planting. You silly yeah. Australian <laughs> time over there. Nice. <laughs> I'm so excited about your announcement, Michelle. And also I want to let people know I put in the uh, vibrant call in line and the interverse group on Telegram a link to the uh, PDF of the slides if anybody wants reference good, good. to the herbs there it's a great reference sheet so i hope people do that nice awesome uh well dude chance you're a great host as always it's always fun uh to hook up with gabe um kyle it was really great meeting you man i know we're gonna be in your neck of the woods uh sometime next year so i would love an herb walk 
or a dinner or a week, we can go do something or whatever. But uh, I think that'll be a lot of fun. Um, as far as how people can reach me, symbolicstudies.com. Uh, I'm all over the place on social media. I am light on updates right now, but it's because I'm focusing on a main video. Uh, I'm trying a different approach. And so um, there is one topic that is near and dear to my heart that I am working on. So um, in a few weeks, that'll be released. But until then, I'll just be on podcasts uh, and whatnot. So this was fun as always. I have some notes, some things I want to follow up with. And uh, yeah, I learned a lot. You're a gentleman and a scholar, and I hope people <laughs> will hit you up for your elemental study packs or to do one-on-one -on -one readings with you sure. or just check out all the great content over on your YouTube channel, Symbolic Studies, also on TikTok. You the man. Thanks right on, for being man. here, dude. Of course, dude. Thank you. All right, Gabriel, what about yourself? Where are you at? Uh, Slick Dissident on YouTube. Uh, just did a show with Juan on Juan that I'm really excited about. Probably going to take uh, about a month, uh, for that to one to come out. Uh, yeah. Uh, but that's about it. I got another one with Juan on deck and then I think we're going to do something with Mario real soon. Uh, so yeah, I'm just kind of, uh, co-showing uh, for the most part. Uh, this was awesome. This was absolutely awesome. This was like the highlight of my week. Uh, it was really great to vibe with all of you. Kyle, it's awesome to meet you, brother. Maybe next time I'm going to get a map of Michigan and I'll wear some spectacles and we'll both wear plaid and we'll be twinning, bro. <laughs> this is super cool. I can't wait to rewatch it. Like the comments were on fire. This was so much fun. I love you guys. I hope Kyle really moves to Missouri. That's what I'm hoping for. I figures. think we should all we should all move to Missouri. It's going to yes, be the new. Yes. It's going to be the new Bear Jerusalem. Well, then think about it, man. It's the G Texas County, Missouri, where the Bears are setting up shop. Is the uh, pop geographic center of population for the United States? So that balance point. There's a lot of occult magic in that. I think. I think you're right, and like consider like the the. Uh, the beautiful inversion we would be doing by taking the one state that is named misery and we would be lighting it up and doing the shadow work of the country. Oh, to Missouri is together. so based though. It's not it, even, it isn't even miserable. That's the funny thing. Right. It's almost like that, that name is meant to, to, you know, cast, keep, keep people away who can't stand the heat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kyle, what do you uh, want to say for us? Uh, closing, yeah, right now man. I'm, I'm right around in this area, Milwaukee. That's we'll awesome. get down to Missouri um, for someday. Um, still looking, but uh, if you're in this area, come to come to my herb shop, Tippy Canoe Herbs. We got one of the few shops in the country where we make all of our herbal products. Um, there's not many like that right now, and so I'm very proud of that. Um, that's what we do. We make a lot of herbal medicine, do a lot of clinical work. Um, teaching. I got an herb school. Um, very busy. And I hope that you can join me for some classes. And it's very, very fun uh, for me to just connect with you guys on a Wednesday night on my very favorite episode or my very favorite show. I used to stay up late, you know, watching Saturday Night Live and American Gladiators and, you know, <laughs> kind of dreaming about what it would be like to be on, you know, be an American gladiator. And here you are like the gladiators of symbolism. And it's so cool. <laughs> and I mean that as a compliment. I don't mean like you're the uh, emperor's like, you know, little toys, you know? No, we're gladiators, <laughs> like <laughs> gratitude, Gra gladiators. gladiators. <laughs> uh, and so thank you so much, Chance. Um, thank you so much, Michelle, for um, introducing me to all of this and for connecting with me um, all that time ago. Mario, it's really great to um uh follow your work and to connect with you tonight and gabe i've been a great fan of yours and your and your uh let's yeah let's go for the the gemini twin michigan plaid stuff next time <laughs> let's do it let's do it bro it, we won't even plan it let's just have let's just, all right <laughs> you know I, i'm wondering about the, the same way care. i know man it's <laughs> it's cool it's super cool and similar beards uh just yeah. don't stroke it on screen please <laughs> so kyle i wanted to ask about the the title tip of canoe because we have a tip of canoe in indiana is there yeah, a, i was born there... in tip of canoe county indiana that's right home Get hospital uh in uh, in lafayette so the bat the uh the battleground where prophet's rock is is a very po important place to me 
And wow. My family, my family lives in Indianapolis and Muncie. So I go, oh. I go through Tippecanoe County a lot. And it's just, it's that whole, you know, I, I don't really have much connection to that other than I was born there and I lived there for six months, but I really like, um, the idea of the, the, the place that you were born is where your placenta was buried yeah. and a place that has like a lot of power. And so, I don't know, and just the name Tippecanoe just has a fun resonance. So oh. I don't know why exactly I chose it other than uh, all of those reasons, but it's, uh, yeah. that's it. so you're, are you in Indiana? I am in Indiana and man, I got to just, I'll try to be quick cause I know we're trying to get wrap it up, but just uh, maybe last week or maybe two weeks back, I was uh, going to, I have family in uh, Warsaw, uh, which is just around the corner from Tippecanoe. Mm -hmm. And I was really delving into the mythology of the Battle of Tippecanoe and some of the nitty gritty details of it. And, uh, uh, you know, that is the, the origin of the curse, the 20 year curse that was put on the presidential blood, on the presidential line. That is actually, a, maybe people should look it up without going into too much detail. It's a very fascinating topic. But uh, Joe Biden is lined up for that curse to come true. And we all can tell that he is like, just, you know, somebody's going to sneeze on him and he's gone. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's just set up like a domino, ready to happen. And it would be so fascinating to me if it happened near or around the eclipse uh, because I do believe there was eclipse magic uh, propagandized in the time of that battle. So there was an eclipse that was used to kind of generate animosity in uh, in the people uh, to get that battle kicked off. And then there was a curse that was put on the bloodline of the presidents. And it's been it's come true many times with just a couple excep exceptions. Um but it looks like they're trying to, you know, they're trying to fulfill that prophecy in a just fascinating way. And so I was going back to my uh, my family's house there in Warsaw, and we were cutting down this grandmother tree in our backyard. And it was just heart wrenching to me. It was like a real like a serious, like literalizing the term fall, you know with the, this gigantic, beautiful tree that's like a landmarker for the lake people. Uh, when they come back to the boat ramp, that tree is their signature that they look for to for how to get back to the ramp for the inlet for their boats. So it's like this just remarkable change of the landscape at large. And so the tr I actually got to record the tree falling, and it shook the ground like none other. And you could actually hear it in the camera with this little video. But what is really trippy is that my father is uh, doing a storybook right now that is based on Jack and the Beanstalk. And I'm like shaking him by the shoulder saying, don't you realize how magical it is that you've got this giant tree that just went down in your backyard that actually left a hole in the earth when it fell and you're reading Jack and the Beanstalk right now. Do you realize how magical this world is? And he's like, I didn't really think of it. I'm like, oh my gosh, you just don't see it. <laughs> so uh, long story short, I got to actually get uh, some images of the tree rings. And bro, I think I can do the dendrochronology and find 1811 when Tippecanoe battle happened, because that's the same year that the Mississippi River went, went backwards in reverse. They, they call it a panther in the sky. That was the eclipse, the panther in the sky. That's what it was called for the Shawnee. Oh, bro, we got to yeah, talk. Well, I'll, well, I'm gonna next time I come to Indiana, which won't be long. We're I'm gonna connect with you. Yeah, dude. Yes, that is so cool. Panther in the sky. I am all over that. <laughs> okay, man. Yeah, that was so fun. Got to got that. Awesome. Out. I'm glad too. Have you ever thought about like what a bastard Jack is, though? <laughs> Mr. Planter. <laughs> he was supposed to go. This was something Owen Benjamin was joking about the other day, but like he was supposed to go and do something with the money and he bought beans instead. And then, so he's already breaking the rules. He's like, yeah, I'll just make all this money if I buy these magic beans. And then <laughs> he goes on the giant's property and kills the giant and steals his gold goose or whatever. Like what a bad guy. And that's totally. the hero. Like so, <laughs> that's the hero we're teaching our kids. So like, this is your uh, fairy tale. What the heck? <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll give my announcements real quick. There's a really great show 
coming out soon. Uh, Here for the Truth podcast. Watch out for that on Sunday. Gave one of uh, the better versions of my refutation of pop culture Gnosticism and simulation theory, fake world, demiurge, loose factory bullshit. It's a really good conversation with your Asimos and Joel over at Here for the Truth. And we'll be seeing them as our guests, uh, guests of honor next week on Vibrant, where we're going to talk about the virtues in the much obscured and misunderstood and poorly represented philosophies of Ayn Rand, actually. So that ought to be fascinating. And I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, Gabriel is going to be a good one. See you guys there next Wednesday for Vibrant. And please get in touch with me if you want to do some tuning or a uh, Oracle card session, because the basically November is there's no there's nothing left open in November and we're starting to break into scheduling for December. So if you want to do that sooner than later, then get in my email chance to interverse podcast.com and yes owen is a height supremacist but i understand why you would be like it makes a lot of sense (laughs) all right guys it's been fun thanks for hanging out and uh wow battle of tippecanoe was november 7th whoa yeah there's just the weave would never end we better just go ahead and wrap it up love you all mario michelle kyle gabriel everyone in the chat thank you so much it's been a great night and i'll talk to you all next time bye-bye good night (laughs) Later.